Chapter 1 Beatrice's heart was tired, sore, and most importantly, she was bored. She'd been in their bumpy wagon for hours today, and walked beside it for hours and hours the past few weeks. Her father had decided he was going to make millions as a gold miner in Creed, Colorado, and at 18, Beatrice had no beau, so she was going with her parents. She didn't really think much good would come from chasing a fortune, but she had no say in the matter. She sat in the back of the wagon while her father drove. She'd been allowed to ride for a bit today, but only because she had twisted her ankle the night before. Usually she walked. He'd said today was the day they would reach their new home. It had been all she could do to keep from saying, finally. Beatrice loved her parents and respected them both, but she would rather be anywhere in the world than on this wild goose chase to find a fortune. She looked down at the book she clutched in her hands, wishing she could concentrate on it. Of course, she'd read it so many times she already had it memorized, so perhaps that was keeping her from paying attention as she should. That and worries about what her new home would be like. She looked up from her book, expecting to see the canvas cover of the wagon and nothing else. Instead of seeing the rough fabric, she saw a woman sitting across from her, as pretty as you please. Who are you? How could someone have gotten in there? She'd never seen this woman before in her life. Get out. Quick. The woman was waving frantically at the back flap. Tell your parents you need to relieve yourself. Anything? Beatrice stared at the woman, trying to figure out not only who she was, but how she'd gotten into the wagon. Why? Just do it. Please. The woman's voice was urgent as if it was a matter of life and death. Beatrice felt herself stirred to activity by the woman's words. She didn't know who she was, or why she was there, but she felt the urgency in her voice. Dad, stop the wagon. She didn't know why, but she had to obey. She felt compelled to do what the stranger asked of her. The wagon slowly drew to a halt and she jumped down from the back, landing gingerly on her already abused ankle. I'm going to walk for a bit. What about your ankle? her mother asked, looking surprised. It was very swollen last night, I don't think you should be walking. Beatrice wasn't surprised by her mother's concern. She'd always thought of others first. Just for a little while, Beatrice told her. She realized how narrow the path was. I'll walk behind. If you get too far ahead of me, I'll find you in Creed. Creed, Colorado. It wasn't the place she wanted to spend her life, but she had little choice. Hopefully her father would get over his gold bug quickly. As she walked, she daydreamed as she always did, thinking about her future. The pain in her ankle wasn't quite as bad as it had been that morning, and she tried to push it to the back of her mind. In her dreams, she was always married to a kind man who loved her cooking, and more importantly, loved her beyond belief. She saw herself with a house full of children, playing games with them, and teaching them to love reading the same way she did. As she daydreamed, she heard a scream and watched as the wagon fell off the trail and down into a deep ravine. She cried out, calling for her parents, but the woman appeared again, shaking her head. They're gone, Beatrice. You'll have to continue on without them. She announced the words in the same voice she'd have used to tell her it was time for supper. I have to try. Beatrice hurried toward the ravine, determined to do something, anything that would bring her parents back. She could see a dark shadowy figure down in the ravine moving toward the wagon. Who is that? What's he doing? That's death. He's taking your parents to their reward. No. They can't be gone yet. The stranger caught her arms, keeping her from plunging to her own death beside her parents. There's nothing that can be done. Nothing. Beatrice stared at the woman. They're the only people I know in the whole western half of the country. They're my parents. She was too shocked and horrified to even cry. Why didn't you save them, too? How could anyone have thought saving her and letting her parents die was the right thing to do? The woman shook her head, looking sad. It was my mission to save you, not them. Why? Her parents were so much more important than she could ever be. All of their belongings, all of her money, had just fallen into the ravine with them. What could she possibly do without them? How would she survive? 
It's not mine to question why. I just follow orders. She put her arm around Beatrice and walked on, past the wagon, down the side of the mountain. Come with me. We have to get to Crete on time. I don't know who you are or what you want, but you let my parents die, how can I trust you? All at once, the tears coursed down her cheeks and sobs racked her body. The woman looked at her sadly. You must. Having nowhere else to go, Beatrice followed the stranger, but she didn't trust her. Not one little bit. An hour passed and she limped along, the stranger oddly silent at her side. Then another. And then another. It was nearing sundown when she limped into Creed, Colorado, wondering if she would ever be able to smile again. Her dress, her only dress, was torn and dirty. Her ankle hurt, but it was nothing to how much her heart hurt. She would give anything for the numbness she'd felt when her parents had first fallen to their deaths. She stopped and sat down on a bench, refusing to go even a step further. Why should she? There was no place to go, no people to see. She didn't even have a change of clothes. Beatrice buried her face in her hands and cried. What was she supposed to do now? Are you all right? Beatrice looked up and saw a kind-looking man in his mid-twenties. He was handsome in a way that made her heart beat faster, and he was looking at her with a helpful expression. Beatrice shook her head, unsure what to say. The man sat beside her, where had the woman gone? And he took her hand in his. She was shocked for a moment at the forward gesture, then took the comfort she could. Do you have somewhere to go? She shook her head again. Nowhere. Her parents didn't have a house they'd planned to move to. They were going to set up a tent outside town. It had been a foolhardy plan, but now no one was looking for them. Where are your parents? At the question, asked in such a kind voice, she turned to him and buried her face in his shoulder. D dead, was all she could manage before the tears started up again. The man frowned. So who did you come to town with? This is not a good place for a young lady to be alone. She got herself under control enough to answer. They died on the way into town. I walked after they fell down into the ravine. Oh, I'm so sorry. He frowned at her, wondering how to phrase what he needed to offer. I could let you stay with me, but if I did, you'll be a fallen woman. I'm a bachelor, and I don't have anyone who could possibly chaperone us. He wished he could keep her, though, she was a beautiful young woman, despite the dirt on her face. Is there no one else? she asked, her voice small. How was she going to make it through life with no parents and nowhere at all to stay? He shook his head. There's no one in this whole blasted town I'd trust with a young lady. He bit his lip. Wait. The reverend from Bachelor is here today. Maybe he can take you home with him? His sister lives with him, so it would be perfectly acceptable. Beatrice got herself together and nodded. I will meet this reverend. Is he a good man? She wasn't sure she could go back down the trail, past the point where her parents had died, but she had to try. They wouldn't want her to die with them. As far as I know, he is. He held his hand out to her. Come on. I can't hold hands with you. I don't even know your name. Beatrice couldn't believe she was worried about social niceties when she wasn't sure where she'd be laying her head that night. My name is Arthur. Arthur Jameson. And you are? Beatrice Hart. Will you walk with me now, Miss Hart? Arthur asked the question calmly. He wanted to help the young lady, but he wasn't sure how. The entire town of Creed was unscrupulous. Why, women had even started disappearing around town. No, he couldn't leave her alone. Beatrice nodded, but she didn't take his hand, instead choosing to walk along beside him toward their destination. The man walked across the muddy road to the boardwalk on the other side and stopped, looking both ways. There he is. He urged her to follow him as he all but ran through the town to get to the pastor. Reverend Bing. A man who looked to be close to forty stopped and looked over at her. Beatrice thought the man's eyes were kind. She let Mr. Jameson do the talking for her, though, because she was still quite unable to concentrate on much of anything in her grief. This young lady, 
Beatrice Hart, has just arrived in town. Apparently, her parents were killed on the way in. Is there anything you can do for her, Reverend? Reverend Bing looked at Beatrice, his face thoughtful. This is definitely not the place for a lady alone. If my sister had come with me today, I would take you home with me immediately. She's not with me, though, so I can't take you on the drive home to Bachelor. It would be unseemly to be alone together. He looked as if he wanted to help, but couldn't find a way. Beatrice bit her lip, feeling the tears welling up in her eyes again. I'm not sure what to do, Reverend. I'm completely alone now. Without his help, she was back to where she'd started. Alone, dirty, and frightened. The Reverend frowned, looking back and forth between Beatrice and Arthur. I happen to know that Arthur is a good man. I could marry the two of you before I leave Creed. Beatrice was shocked at the very suggestion. She couldn't marry a stranger. I met him less than fifteen minutes ago, sir. I don't think that could possibly be the answer. Arthur looked at the pretty little girl beside him. Well, at least she'd be pretty if she had her hair fixed or her dress wasn't torn, or her face wasn't splotchy from crying. He was just at the point in his life where he was willing to think about marriage. He was a telegraph operator, and he made a good, honest living. May I speak to you alone for a moment, Miss Hart? The Reverend smiled as if he knew exactly what Arthur was up to, and Arthur nodded to him. Beatrice walked a few feet away from the Reverend and turned to him, her face perplexed. What is it, Mr. Jameson? I know it's sudden and very bad timing, but a marriage really is the answer. I have no romantic interests at the moment, and I make a good, honest living. I'm a telegraph operator here in Creed. My house is small, but it's certainly large enough for two people, Arthur needed her to agree to marry him. Something deep inside him told him that she was his chance for happiness, and he could not let it pass him by. Beatrice stared at him for a moment, shocked to find that she was considering the offer. My parents have just died, Mr. Jameson. I believe I would need time to grieve them before, being your wife in every sense of the word. She blushed as she said it, knowing that she was asking for something very few men would grant her. He frowned, I can understand that. How long do you want? She shrugged. I think a six-month mourning period would be appropriate, don't you? He shook his head. No, not at all. How about one month? One. She stared at him, aghast. How could she possibly be ready to fully be his wife in one month? Three months. Two. When he grinned at her, she couldn't help but smile at his charm. The man was likable, so hopefully love would follow. Two it is. She bit her lip nervously. I'm afraid I have nothing to my name. My parents and all of our possession went off the trail into a ravine. I happened to be walking behind the wagon and survived the incident and scathed. She couldn't help but wonder about the woman who had been beside her for hours, but disappeared as soon as he showed up. Who could she possibly be? He nodded. I understand. I presume you have the ability to sew? Absolutely. I've been sewing since I was a child. Then we'll get you some fabric, and you'll have clothes very soon. He glanced over his shoulder to see the Reverend standing there, waiting for them. I think we need to marry now. Reverend Bing will want to be back to Bachelor, before it's too dark for him to see the trail. She sucked in a breath and closed her eyes. Let's go get married, then. He grinned at her, noting that she didn't protest this time when he took her hand in his. An hour later, Arthur was escorting Beatrice into his home. I only have one bedroom, but I'll sleep on the sofa until you're ready to really be my wife. He'd foregone kissing her at the wedding ceremony, knowing that he wanted their first kiss to be a private one. Thank you for that. Beatrice looked through the small house, which was attached to the telegraph office. There was a small but serviceable kitchen, a parlor with a sofa and one chair, as well as a low table in front of the sofa, and a bedroom with one bed and a dresser. This house will do just fine. As she said the words, she thought back to her daydreams about her future house once she was married. That dream house was in the country, with chickens and cows everywhere. There was even a dog that the children tried to ride. Do you have a dog? 
He shook his head. No, I don't. The barking might keep me from being able to take the telegraph messages correctly. I see. The tears sprang to Beatrice's eyes yet again. Why was she mourning a dog that only existed in her imagination? Do you have any books? Yes, I do. I'm an avid reader. He led her to the parlor, showing her his selection of books against one wall. Did that mean she enjoyed reading as well? There are several I've not read yet. She felt a small amount of excitement at the fact that there would be new books for her to read. Beatrice couldn't help but wonder what was wrong with her. It was her wedding day, and the only thing that made her at all happy was the fact that her groom had new books for her. I'm glad. He took her to the kitchen. Do you cook? I can cook very simple things, but not anything complicated. He paused, deciding to tell the full truth. The truth is that I can cook beans and cornbread. Nothing else. I can cook. My mother has been working with me since I was a little girl. She was excited that there was something she could do to help him after he'd gotten her out of the mess she was in. Oh, good. I'll look forward to eating more than beans and cornbread, then. She smiled. I can certainly do better than that, Mr. Jameson. He frowned. I'm your husband now. Perhaps you should call me Arthur. He knew she was keeping up the formalities to put a distance between them, but that was the last thing he wanted. He would do everything he could to court her properly in the next two months, and truly for the rest of their lives. I will try. The store will be closed for the day, but perhaps we could go there in the morning so you can get some fabric, as well as some more flavorful foods. I would assume you don't wish me to try to find work. You want me to keep your house? She wished she'd thought to ask him that before she married him, but she wasn't sure her answer would have been any different. That dream house was in the country, with chickens and cows everywhere. There was even a dog that the children tried to ride. Do you have a dog? He shook his head. No, I don't. The barking might keep me from being able to take the telegraph messages correctly. I see. The tears sprang to Beatrice's eyes yet again. Why was she mourning a dog that only existed in her imagination? Do you have any books? Yes, I do. I'm an avid reader. He led her to the parlor, showing her his selection of books against one wall. Did that mean she enjoyed reading as well? There are several I've not read yet. She felt a small amount of excitement at the fact that there would be new books for her to read. Beatrice couldn't help but wonder what was wrong with her. It was her wedding day, and the only thing that made her at all happy was the fact that her groom had new books for her. I'm glad. He took her to the kitchen. Do you cook? I can cook very simple things, but not anything complicated. He paused, deciding to tell the full truth. The truth is that I can cook beans and cornbread. Nothing else. I can cook. My mother has been working with me since I was a little girl. She was excited that there was something she could do to help him after he'd gotten her out of the mess she was in. Oh, good. I'll look forward to eating more than beans and cornbread, then. She smiled. I can certainly do better than that, Mr. Jameson. He frowned. I'm your husband now. Perhaps you should call me Arthur. He knew she was keeping up the formalities to put a distance between them, but that was the last thing he wanted. He would do everything he could to court her properly in the next two months, and truly for the rest of their lives. I will try. The store will be closed for the day, but perhaps we could go there in the morning so you can get some fabric, as well as some more flavorful foods. I would assume you don't wish me to try to find work. You want me to keep your house? She wished she'd thought to ask him that before she married him, but she wasn't sure her answer would have been any different. I do want you to keep house. There's no need for you to work. I make a good salary, and I'm not given to a lavish lifestyle. The only thing I ever splurge on is new books to read. Did she want to work? He'd always thought most women preferred to be able to stay home and keep house. She smiled at that. That is my biggest weakness as well. Then I think we're a good pair. Would you like me to see if I can find something to make for supper? 
and maybe we can spend some time talking and getting to know one another after we've eaten? I'd like that a lot. He led her to the kitchen and quickly showed her where he kept everything, I don't have much to work with. I'll figure something out. She set to work, glad to be able to take her mind off her troubles. Cooking was something she'd always enjoyed, so she gave herself over to it. When she put two bowls of beans on the table, she apologized. I can do more with other ingredients. He shrugged. I'm not worried. I had planned to eat beans for supper tonight anyway. He took her hand in his, bowing his head for a prayer. Father in heaven, please help Beatrice settle into life here in Creed, help her to mourn the loss of her parents, but still be able to make it through her days. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for mentioning me in your prayer. Beatrice took a bite of the beans, thankful she'd made them plenty of times and knew just the right seasoning to use. You're very welcome. What were you going to be doing in Creed? It was rare for a young lady to come to the town. She sighed. My father wanted to come here to mine for gold. I hate the idea of letting riches rule our thoughts, but I came along because I really had nowhere else to go. She wished they had done anything but come to Colorado, to mine for gold. Where are you from? He knew he was peppering her with questions, but he wanted to get to know her. I grew up on a farm in Missouri. Father sold his farm to come out here. Did you go to school there? She nodded, her eyes brightening at the topic. I even taught a couple of terms of school before we headed here. I love teaching. This isn't a town where there will be much chance of teaching. The families are mostly poor, and they don't value education the way I wish they would. That's really sad. Beatrice shook her head. I'm sure I'll have the opportunity to teach our children, then. As soon as she realized that she'd brought up the subject of them having babies, she blushed. She wanted at least a handful, but she'd take whatever God gave her. Do you want a lot of children? He'd never given himself the time to think about children. He'd been too busy working, and there were few decent women to marry in Creed. He'd been considering sending off for a mail-order bride but hadn't let himself think past good meals and a clean home. She nodded. I've always wanted several. My mother was only able to have me, and I know she'd always wished for more. If she couldn't teach, she wanted a whole houseful of children, and she would teach them. She'd do her favorite thing one way or another. Tell me about your mother. He knew she needed to talk about her if it wasn't too painful to do so. Beatrice tried to think of her mother through someone else's eyes. She was pretty and kind. I think her worst fault was doing what my father said as soon as he told her to do something. She never once questioned his decision to sell off everything and move. And you think that was a flaw? She nodded. I do think women should obey their husbands, but within reason. I don't think anyone should ever blindly follow another. Seems I've found myself a wife with the ability to think for herself. Does that bother you? Absolutely not. I've never been the type of man who could let himself fall for a simpering woman. If she thinks I'm as wonderful as some women pretend to think their man is, then she is lacking in common sense. I'm anything but perfect. Beatrice laughed softly. Is that so? Tell me what your biggest fault is. That's not something you can ask your husband on your wedding day. Arthur protested, a smile on his face. But I already did. So you have to answer me. I do, do I? She nodded emphatically. You do. He thought for a moment. My biggest fault is that I don't do more to try to change this town. What do you think is wrong with the town? Beatrice had heard of nothing but how wonderful it would be to live in Creed for their entire journey. What did he know that she didn't? I think the men here live for payday, when they have a chance to go and drink as much liquor as they can. They spend money on booze, women, and gambling. I've never been one to partake of those activities, but I've not tried to stop others. Maybe I should have. Why? She knew many men spent their paychecks on those three things, but she wasn't sure if he objected for religious reasons, or if it was simply because he didn't like to see people waste money. I think the more men who are here and pursue those things, the worse the town gets. 
women have begun disappearing, there are two that no one can find. If it was just one, I could chalk it up to marrying and leaving town. But two, no, I'm worried that there's something sinister going on here in Creed, and I'm not sure what I can do about it. He hadn't even mentioned there was a problem until that very moment. Is there a sheriff? A marshal? There is. There's a rumor that he's on someone's payroll, but I'm not sure if I should believe that or not. I don't think he did a good job investigating after the last fire. The last fire? How many fires have there been? Beatrice was growing more and more worried about the new community she found herself in. Creed has almost completely burned to the ground twice now, it's really not a good place for women or children. I worry about everyone who moves here, hoping the town won't corrupt them. I almost think there's something evil about this place. Or someone evil. He had his suspicions about who it was, but he dared not say anything, because the man was powerful. Are you being fanciful? Or do you really think it might be evil? I really think it might be evil. I wish I was only being fanciful. He was afraid to tell even Beatrice who he thought it was, for fear she would slip and tell someone else. He had no idea how well she kept secrets, she thought about the woman who had been in the wagon with her and later disappeared. She hadn't seemed like she was evil, but maybe she was. She'd certainly let Beatrice's parents die without trying to stop it. Chapter 2 when Beatrice woke early the following morning, it took her a moment to realize where she was. Arthur had been true to his word, taking a blanket and a pillow to sleep in the parlor on the sofa. She spent a moment lying in bed, praying for peace as she went about her day. A new marriage should be a time of joy, but she was still filled with sorrow about her parents. She quickly dressed, having slept in just her petticoats, and hurried into the kitchen to start breakfast. There was little she could cook with the ingredients Arthur had on hand, but he'd been pleased with her beans and cornbread the night before, declaring them a million times better than what he could do. She stopped short when she reached the kitchen, looking at the bounty of food available to her. Spotting Arthur sitting at the table sipping coffee, she grinned. Where did all this food come from? Surely the store isn't open so early. He shrugged. I know the owner and asked him to open up early for me. I do the same when he wants to send a telegram. We try to keep each other happy. Beatrice smiled when she saw the eggs and bacon. Would you like eggs for breakfast? Or I could make some pancakes? Do you have a preference? Arthur looked at her for a moment, before a grin spread across his face. Do you have any idea how wonderful it is for a man like me to have choices about what he can eat? I've had beans and cornbread for three meals a day for years. I'm going to have a real breakfast. She laughed. Yes, you are. And I will do my best to never make beans and cornbread for you. Let's have pancakes. With bacon. Did you get a lot of supplies, or just enough to see us through breakfast? She saw some flour, milk, eggs, butter, syrup, and bacon. But what else had he gotten? Just breakfast. We'll go to the store after we eat, and you can choose a couple of different fabrics to make yourself some dresses, and we'll get some food to fill the ice box. I can't believe I'm going to get real meals. She laughed softly. Will you want me to bring you lunch at the office? As long as you make it, I can pop over to the kitchen to eat it. I'm close enough that I can still hear if a telegraph comes in. The house and the telegraph office were really one and the same, with only a door separating them. All right. It'll be nice to have three meals a day together. Already he was starting to grow on her. At first, she thought he was handsome, but now she was seeing that he was more than that. He was a good man. She was proud to be able to call him her husband. I hope so. My mother always said that she loved my father as long as she didn't have to put up with him too much. Beatrice grinned. I can understand that, I think. She got down a mixing bowl and expertly mixed the batter for pancakes. As soon as she was done, she got out a frying pan and put the bacon on. Do you mind if I change a few things around the house? He shrugged. It's your house as much as it is mine, more, to my way of thinking. You'll be spending more time here, because you'll be home while I'm at the office. 
you have to make it your own. All right. She could already envision how nice the house would look with a gingham tablecloth and matching curtains. I do want you to promise me that you won't leave the house without me. She frowned. Being a prisoner in my own home isn't exactly appealing. Did he not trust her at all? She knew they'd just met, but why would he marry someone if he thought he'd never be able to believe in her? You won't be a prisoner. I worry that someone will snatch you like happened to the other ladies. You'd be welcome to leave if Creed was safer. I see. She felt bad for jumping to conclusions. I'm sorry I said that about being a prisoner. I understand your safety concerns. Good, because I need to know you'll be all right while I work. I would rather you didn't open the door to any men except the reverend, either. He knew keeping her away from other people in the middle of town was a lot to ask of her, but he also knew it would keep her alive. There's no one else you trust, she asked. Surely that couldn't be so. The man had been alone for a long time. He had to have made friends over the years. He shrugged. No one that I'd trust with your life. You're too precious. He blushed a bit after saying the words, realizing he sounded like a lovesick idiot. Beatrice blushed, not looking at him. She didn't know how to react to such a thing. She'd never had a beau, so someone saying sweet words to her like that really threw her for a loop. I'll be as careful as I can be. Good. That's all I ask. After breakfast, they walked over to the mercantile together. I'm happy to come over here with you any time you want me to, but you'll have to let me know. She nodded. So if I run out of milk, I need to come get you and have you walk with me to the mercantile. It seems a little more difficult, but if you're sure that's the only way I'll be safe, then that's what I'll do. Already she respected him more than any other man she'd known. That was a good way to start a marriage. The mercantile was relatively quiet when they arrived. She quickly chose fabric for two dresses and a plain white for a couple of aprons and a nightgown. Then she searched for food. She wanted to cook him wonderful meals because she knew how long he'd lived on beans and cornbread. No one should have to eat the same thing day in and day out for years. She made sure she chose things that would appeal to him, but she also got some things to make a cake. She was sure he'd be thrilled with the treat. She wanted to please him, and that couldn't be a bad thing. On the walk back, they each carried a wooden box filled with their purchases. How long will it take you to make the dresses? he asked. I should have the first done by tomorrow evening, she told him. If I didn't have to cook, I could be done faster, but I have this strange feeling you're looking forward to me cooking for you. I really am. I dreamed that you made a pot roast with carrots and potatoes. He was all but drooling as he talked about it. She grinned. He must not have paid much attention to her purchases except to pay for them, because she'd gotten what she needed for pot roast. Making that for supper would make her happy, because she knew it would please him. They were almost to the house when a man stopped in front of her, bending low as if he was a courtly knight of old. I'm very pleased to make your acquaintance. I'm Archibald Grady. She looked over at Arthur, wondering how he would handle this, deciding to follow his lead whatever he did. She wasn't about to speak to a stranger on the street, anyway. Arthur wanted to kick Archie out of their way, so they could continue on. The man had never been a favorite of his, and he thought he was better than everyone else in town anyway. Archie, this is my wife, Beatrice. We married yesterday. Archie frowned. I see. I guess you had to marry him, because you met him before me. If only you could have held out a little longer for the better man. Beatrice shook her head, I married the right man. She nodded cordially and walked around the man, wanting to break into a run to get away from him, but she didn't have it in her to run on her ankle. There was something about the way he talked that made her skin crawl. Arthur couldn't help but grin at the shocked look on Archie's face as his wife made it clear she wouldn't have chosen him regardless. Stay away from him, Arthur said in a low voice as they reached their home. She nodded. You don't even have to tell me that. There's something about that man that makes me feel like there are spiders climbing all over every inch of my body. Now that he knows you live here, I'd keep the door locked during the day as well. He didn't want to risk anything happening to her, 
and there was something about Archie that made him think danger followed him around. I will do just that. I'll only open to another woman or the reverend. For now, she was busy enough that she wouldn't need to leave. She had so much to do to get settled in properly. Perfect, you're learning fast, I see. He carried his box into the kitchen and set it on the table. I need to get to work. Do you have everything you need? She nodded. I do. I'll be fine. As soon as he was gone, she sat down and looked at her ankle. It still throbbed after all the walking she'd done the day before, but at least the swelling was down. She thought about soaking it in cold water for a moment, but she knew it was more important she get started cooking and sewing. Starting by mixing up the dough for a loaf of bread, she sat at the table kneading it, rather than standing as she normally would. For some reason, Beatrice was worried that Arthur would think she was weak if she told him about her ankle injury, so she'd done her best to not even limp in front of him. She would baby it as much as she could during the day, but when he was around, he would never see her pain. She had landed on her feet after her tragedy, but it wouldn't stay that way if she didn't appear to be strong. No man wanted a weakling for a wife. For lunch, she fixed a thick stew, knowing that he would be hungry when he came in. Before it was time to eat, the bread would be ready as well, and he could have a feast. After everything was cooking, she sat down and propped her foot up, carefully cutting out her first dress. She wasn't worried about the styles at all, more worried about having something that was serviceable. By the time Arthur came home for lunch, she had the bodice of the dress already basted together. Her fingers were sore from sewing so quickly, but she didn't care. She served them each a big bowl of the stew and put the fresh bread on the table along with some butter. Arthur rubbed his hands together when he saw the food. I am already thrilled I married you. Food is definitely the way to keep me happy. He picked up his spoon and took a big bite. Is there a church in town? she asked. He'd said Reverend Bing was from Bachelor, which indicated to her that there probably wasn't. She'd always attended church regularly, so the idea of not having one bothered her. He shook his head. We can drive to Bachelor for church if you'd like, but it's a long drive. She frowned. It was between here and Bachelor that my parents died. She wasn't sure she could handle making that drive any time soon. His hand reached out to cover hers. We don't have to go if it frightens you. I think it might. I'm not sure how long it'll be before I can take that road. Do you want me to send some men down to try to recover their bodies? Beatrice's eyes met his. I'd like to give them a proper burial. Is it safe for people to go and try to get them? Arthur shook his head. It's not, but if I offer enough money, I can get a couple of men who would be willing to risk it. I won't risk anyone else when I know they're gone. How can I be willing to sacrifice more lives to that horrible ravine? I think that's the smart answer. I'm sorry. He wanted to take care of her, and he knew it would help her to have their bodies safely buried, but how could he risk the lives of others to make it happen? She shrugged. I suppose I knew it wasn't safe when I asked. I can't imagine how I'd feel if more people died because of my desire to bury my parents. I can say goodbye without their actual bodies being there. It would be harder, but it wouldn't be worth the potential cost. I could ask Reverend Bing to come to Creed and perform a funeral service if you think it would help you to feel better about it all. Beatrice considered for a moment. I don't think so. I don't want to ask anyone to drive that narrow road for any reason. All right. He bit into his bread, closing his eyes with pleasure. He chewed slowly, determined to change the subject. You are a fabulous cook. She grinned. I do enjoy cooking a lot, not as much as reading, but there's nothing I enjoy quite as much as reading. She couldn't wait to start baking for him. She wanted to spoil him with treats. We should read together tonight. Do you enjoy reading aloud? Or having someone read aloud to you? I enjoy both. Maybe you could read to me, and I could continue working on my dress. She loved the idea of spending time with him, but she really needed her dress to be done as soon as possible. Well, you're an easy wife to entertain. I've never felt the need for someone to entertain me. I'll be just fine staying home every night. 
Beatrice had never been one to run around with friends instead of reading or simply staying home to do her chores. She believed in living a simple life, so that's what she did. Sounds good to me. The only real entertainment in this town is the saloon anyway, and I just don't see you feeling comfortable there. I don't either. Do you go there? No, I never have. I've never seen the appeal of working all week to throw my money away on Friday evening. I know so many men who have nothing left of their paycheck at the end of the weekend, though. It's always made me sad. She frowned. There's nothing we can do? I can't think of any ways to keep people away, so I just mind my own business and live my life the way I know I ought to. He wiped his mouth with a napkin and got to his feet. Lunch was wonderful. Thank you for cooking it for me. Thank you for marrying me and giving me a place to live and food to cook. I am counting my blessings. My life could have taken a very bad turn if I hadn't met you on that bench. He leaned down and brushed his lips across her cheek. I'm the lucky one. I'm very pleased to have you as my wife. As he left, she smiled, thinking that she truly was blessed. Blessed that a man like him had been the first to see her, and not someone like Archie. True to his word, after supper that evening, Arthur read to her from one of his books. This one is called Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain. Have you read it? Beatrice shook her head. I've spent most of my life reading the classics. I have read almost all of Shakespeare's plays. I've had little funds to buy the current popular novels. I can understand that. It truly is the only way I've splurged over my years here. I have always wished there was someone close who shared my love of books, but there was no one. She sat beside him on the couch as she stitched her dress. She'd never made a garment quite as quickly as she was trying to make this one so it was a new experience. As he read, she laughed at all the appropriate places, imagining the happenings in the story. When he finally closed the book, she smiled at him. Thank you for sharing that lovely story with me. I can read some more tomorrow evening, if you'd like. She nodded emphatically. I'm enjoying it very much. It makes the time go by so quickly as I work. She carefully folded the dress, putting it into a basket she'd purchased to keep her sewing and mending in. He moved closer to her on the sofa, his arm going around her shoulders. When the reverend told us to kiss at the end of the wedding yesterday, I knew that I wanted our first time to be private, when we'd had a little more time to get to know one another. She looked at him with wide eyes, nodding a bit. I can agree with that. Did that mean he'd kiss her? She wasn't sure how she felt about doing something so intimate so soon after meeting him, but they were married. I feel like we've done that today. Would you mind if I kissed you? Beatrice looked up into his eyes for a moment, shaking her head. I've never been kissed before, so I have no idea what I'm doing. Arthur smiled. I've rarely kissed anyone, and I love the idea of kissing you. If you don't mind that is. I don't. She lifted her face, waiting as his mouth descended on hers. His lips were soft against hers, and she found she liked it, leaning in closer. Her hands found his shoulders, and she kneaded the muscles under his shirt, before she pulled back, looking up at him with a smile. You were right. That was much nicer than a rushed first kiss, with the reverend watching us the whole while. I'm glad you approve. He stroked her arm with one hand. I'll say good night now. She stood up, taking her sewing basket with her. Good night, Arthur. She hurried from the room, stopped, then went back. Is it a bad thing that I'm letting you distract me from my sorrow over the deaths of my parents? He shook his head. I don't think so at all. Your parents would have wanted you to find happiness, wouldn't they? They would have. Thank you for helping me find it. She turned and walked away, not allowing herself to limp until she was out of his view. She'd spent a great deal less time on her ankle today, and it was already feeling a bit better. She quickly undressed and slid between the sheets, lying in the bed staring up at the ceiling. She relived the kiss they'd shared over and over, thinking about just how much she enjoyed having his lips pressed against hers. She didn't know if that made her a wanton woman or not, and she wished her mother were there to talk to. She always knew the right thing to say to Beatrice when she was unsure of herself. 
At that moment it hit her for the first time that her mother would never be there to run to with her troubles again. She wouldn't be there to hold her first grandchild, or to tell her that she'd done the right thing by marrying so quickly. A life without her father didn't hit her nearly as hard as the idea of a life without her mother did. She wished there was a way for her to ask just a few more questions. For her to hug her mother one more time, but the opportunity was gone, just as her mother was. She rolled to her side, hugging her knees to her chest. She would strive to be the kind of mother her own had been as a way to honor her. Beatrice fell asleep with a smile on her lips and a tear on her cheek. She felt as if she'd truly said goodbye as she laid there in the dark, whispering to her mother, telling her how much she'd miss her and the things they'd never do together again. How was it possible to get past the death of a beloved parent? Marrying quickly was a good start. Maybe others wouldn't see it the same way, but she certainly did. She would live her life as her parents would have wanted. It was the only way to honor them. Chapter 3 It was just past lunch time the following day when Beatrice heard a knock at the door. Arthur was off in his office, so she went to the door and asked, Who is it? She carefully kept the door shut, just as Arthur had insisted. I'm Millie Bing, Reverend Bing's younger sister. I brought you some muffins to welcome you to Colorado. May I come in? The other woman's voice was very sweet. Beatrice was excited to have someone, anyone, pay her a visit. As much as she enjoyed her time with Arthur, she needed female companionship as well. She opened the door wide, smiling at the girl. She wished her new dress was finished, but she was sure Millie had heard the whole story, so what did it matter that she didn't look perfect? It's so nice to meet you, Millie. I'm Beatrice Hart, heir, Jameson. I wonder if that name will ever just roll off my tongue. Beatrice held her hand down at her side, using it to hide the worst of the tears in the dress. Millie laughed, a sweet laugh, that filled the house. I've been told that women eventually adjust to their new name after marriage, but it's not easy. Well, I certainly think that will be the case with me. Beatrice realized she was still blocking the doorway. Come in. I want to hear everything there is to know about you. No, you first. Millie stepped inside, following Beatrice into the kitchen. I'm very sorry about your parents. Beatrice frowned, nodding. I'm still not sure how I survived. She wanted to tell her about the woman she'd seen, but she was afraid Millie would think she was crazy. She needed friends too much to be willing to risk sounding insane. I felt like I had to get out of the wagon. I called for my father to stop the horses, and he did. I said I'd walk behind for a while, and the next thing I knew, the wagon had tumbled into a ravine. And you weren't hurt at all? It sounds like God wanted you to live, so he saved you. But why would he save me and not my parents? That was at the core of what bothered her. Shouldn't God have saved her parents as well? Millie shrugged. I don't know. I don't understand God's ways all the time, but I'm sure there was a good reason. I miss them, Beatrice said softly, wishing she had the right words to express how deeply she felt about it. I understand. What was life like for you back where you came from? I asked my brother, he knew it was an M state, but that's all he remembered. I come from Missouri. I was a schoolteacher there, but when my father caught gold fever, he thought I needed to come along as well. So here I am. Beatrice didn't add that she'd resented her father for tearing her away from her life, for it wouldn't do any good to speak ill of the dead. She found she was still angry with him for her mother's death, even though her anger did no good at all. I'm so sorry. And now you're here in a place where you know no one, and it's not really safe to go outside alone. I wish I could say differently, but Crete is not a good place to be. Millie sighed heavily. I would love to get more involved in my brother's ministry, but for the most part, I need to stay home and keep his house. There are bad men everywhere, but Crete seems to have more than its share. Well, you can visit me anytime you'd like. I would love to have a friend here. I'd have come yesterday, but one of the ladies in our congregation died. She was giving birth to her fifth child, and something went wrong. I was cooking for them. That's so sad. I'd like to pray for them. What are their names? Lucy is the mother who died in childbirth. 
Royce is her widower, trying his best to cope with five children. I don't know how he's going to do it. Beatrice shook her head. I can't even imagine. Millie swiped at a tear. Well, let me just say that I'm glad to have a friend here. There are some ladies who I spend time with after church on Sundays, but it's usually while we quilt or do some other thing together. There's no just sitting around and talking for the sheer joy of having a friend. Well, then it's time there is. Beatrice leaned forward and took Millie's hand in hers. I've had very few close female friends over the years, but I can see you're going to be one. I feel the same about you. I'm so glad you're here now. Millie smiled. Will I see you in church on Sunday? I don't think so. After losing my parents on that narrow path, I don't want to drive it just yet. I hope that eventually I'll find the courage within me, but I watched their wagon tumble into the ravine. I can't get the sight of it out of my head. Beatrice hated keeping herself from doing things she should do, but at least for now, it was what needed to happen. Well, then I'll have to come visit you as often as I can. I like that idea. A lot. Beatrice jumped to her feet. Where are my manners? Would you like some coffee or tea? Maybe if she plied her new friend with refreshments, she would visit her more often. Tea would be wonderful, if you don't mind. And we can have muffins with it. That sounds absolutely fantastic. Would you mind if I sewed while we chat? I want to finish a dress today. This is all I have. All of my clothes were in the wagon, and Arthur said it wouldn't be safe to go try to retrieve my things. When she'd left Missouri, her grandmother had pressed a locket into her hand. It had belonged to her mother before her. Of all the things that were gone, the locket was what she regretted the most. Even more than her books. Oh, please. If you have any mending, I'd be happy to help you out with it. No, please just sit and talk to me. I'm so happy for the company, I can't even express it. You don't have to express it. As an unmarried female in this area, I understand. I mean I know you're married, but it's not the same as if you married a man you'd been courting for a while. You married because there was no other option, and you were in a pickle. My brother told me all about it, he was kind to marry us immediately. Arthur suggested I go home with him and live with the two of you, because that wouldn't be improper, but it wouldn't have been right for your brother and I to be alone for so long, and I don't think I'd have made it over the pass without screaming until he pushed me out of his wagon. Millie chuckled. I've never seen Callum do anything of the sort, but I've never seen him faced with a woman screaming that much, either. So I suppose it's possible he'd do just that. Beatrice poured the tea into cups and carried them to the table. She set one in front of her new friend and one at a place for herself, then put two small plates on the table. When she'd taken her seat, she reached for one of the muffins. What kind are they? Strawberry. I prefer to do a mix of blackberries and raspberries, but they're not in season. But these are still tasty. They sound delicious. Beatrice bit into one of the muffins. You'll have to give me your recipe. As a new wife, I'm trying all sorts of recipes out to make my husband happy. I'd love to share my recipe with you. Callum and I eat them often. Millie looked around the house. Are you waiting to make it your own? The house was obviously decorated by a bachelor. Only as long as I have to. Beatrice shook her head. I thought it would be more important for me to have dresses than for the windows and table to be clothed to my taste. You have a very good point there. I'm certainly willing to work on a tablecloth or curtains while you sew. I couldn't take advantage of your friendship that way. That's not taking advantage at all. That's neighbors helping neighbors. If a new woman moved in next to you and needed help, you'd help her. I can tell you're that kind of woman. Finally, Beatrice nodded. I'll fetch the cloth I intend to use. How long will you be in town? Oh, a couple more hours probably. Callum had business here, so I asked if I could come along. He'll let me know when he's ready to go back to Bachelor. When Beatrice handed Millie the fabric, she smiled. This is lovely. I think it will work beautifully for your kitchen. The two of them worked together most of the afternoon, with Beatrice getting up a few times to tend to supper.
Arthur came into the kitchen at the end of his shift and looked at Millie in surprise. I didn't know you were here. Beatrice smiled at Arthur, so happy to finally have a friend. She came to bring me muffins, and there are even a couple of them left. We may have eaten some of them this afternoon. She was bubbling over with excitement over her new friend. She couldn't wait to tell him about her day. May have? He leaned down and kissed her forehead. In other words, you ate most of them and left the crumbs for me? Beatrice laughed. We left you two whole muffins. You may thank us now, Millie looked amused as she watched them. A knock sounded at the door, and she jumped up, laying her sewing on the table. Thank you for having me, Beatrice. I'm sure that's Callum. Beatrice wiped her hands and walked her friend to the door. Thank you so much for coming over, and for the muffins. It was lovely to just sit with you and talk. I watched you with Arthur just now. Considering you've only known one another for a few days, I can see you're going to be very happy together. Beatrice blushed, glancing back over her shoulder. I certainly hope so. He's a good man. He is. You chose well, or God chose well for you, as I tend to think. Millie quickly hugged Beatrice. I will see you again soon. After Millie left, Beatrice hurried back to the kitchen. I'm so excited she came to visit today. It was nice to have someone to talk to. You can't talk to me? he asked, his eyes twinkling with mischief. I can, but I have to be so careful not to use a word that's longer than one syllable. It was all she could do not to giggle as she said the words, wondering where this teasing nature had come from. It wasn't something that had ever reared its head back in Missouri, he laughed. You're a brat, Mrs. Jameson. She shrugged. I guess I can be. I can't remember the last time I had a chance for my playful side to come out. It's been all work for the last year for sure. Come to think of it, I haven't had a chance to be playful either. This place doesn't lend itself to lightheartedness. Then it's our job to make it better. What can we do? He stared at her, aghast. What do you mean? Well, if everyone in town is so unhappy, what would fix that? I could bake cookies and pass them out as people walked past our door. What else? He shook his head emphatically. I'm not against making people happy, but it's not safe here. Until we know where those two women disappeared to, you're going to be only out with me. I thought we'd discussed that. We did, but I really hate the idea of not being able to be independent. Are you sure there's no other way? She badly wanted to be free to leave the house during the day while he worked. She couldn't even do their food shopping without him. I'm sure. I'm sorry, but to keep you safe, I have to keep you inside when I'm working. I would be willing to go out with you before work if you wanted to hand out cookies, though. Would that make you happy? She thought about it for a moment. It might. What if Millie came and she and I handed out the cookies? He shook his head. Absolutely not. I'm fine if you want to be her friend, but I don't want you going out with her without someone there to protect you. She nodded slowly. All right. I guess you'll do it with me. Maybe on Monday mornings? Because everyone hates Mondays. Arthur smiled at that. Do you hate Mondays? Not at all. I love them. That's the day the school week begins. When I was teaching school, I lived for Mondays. Well, now you can live for Mondays, because you get to hand out cookies. Beatrice smiled at him. Thank you for not telling me my ideas are stupid. I would never tell you that. Never. You're a good husband to me, Arthur. Thank you. After supper, we can read more of Tom Sawyer. I'll read to you while you finish your dress. I would thoroughly enjoy that. Beatrice grinned. She would love it if he kissed her again, but she didn't dare say so. Was it polite to flirt with your husband that way? Or was it too forward? Good. That's what we'll do, then. He watched her as she efficiently served their meal. He could see her as a teacher, sitting in the front of a classroom. He suspected that children enjoyed it when she taught them. He knew he would have had a crush on the schoolteacher. There was no doubt in his mind. 
Did boys ever have a crush on you when you taught them? Beatrice blushed, looking at him questioningly. What makes you ask that? Well, I know if I'd been your student, I'd have been hanging on your every word. I'd probably have carved our initials into my desk as well. She put her hands on her hips, stopping her work for a moment. You were one of those boys who liked to vandalize the school desks? Shame on you, Arthur. He chuckled. I never once actually did it, but if you'd been standing in front of me every day, I don't know that I'd have been able to stop myself. She shook her head at him, moving around him to put their drinks on the table. It's time to eat. If you can keep yourself from carving our initials into the kitchen table, you're free to eat with me. He waited until her hands were empty, before grabbing her about the waist and pulling her close to him. I wanted to kiss you when I came into the kitchen earlier, but you had a friend with you. She grinned at him. You know we're allowed to kiss, we are married. She raised her lips to his, pleased that he wanted to touch her just as much as she wanted to be touched. I know. He leaned down and pressed his lips to hers. Hello, wife. Hello. She was slightly out of breath. Every time he touched her, she was amazed by her reaction to him. I'm starving. Why don't you let me eat, you crazy woman? She wrinkled her nose at him, but took her place at the table. I'll let you eat, but you need to stop grabbing me in the kitchen. This is my workplace, you know. He took her hand and brought it to his lips. I hope I never get so old that I don't have a desire to grab you in the kitchen. She grinned at him, surprised at how sweet he was being. They'd married for a very specific reason, but both of them seemed to have forgotten it. Will you pray already? He laughed. Yes, I'll pray. She finished the dress while they were sitting together in the parlor that night. For a moment she thought about jumping up and trying it on so she could show him that she didn't always have dirty, ripped clothing, but she decided to wait. While he was at work the next day, she would take a bath, wash her hair, and put on the new dress. Then she would look good to him. After he'd finished reading, he looked over at her. Did you get the dress done? She nodded. I did. I think I'm pleased with it. As long as it's not torn, I think you'll look great. She made a face. I wouldn't make a dress torn, silly man. He pulled her across the sofa to him. I'm considering this time our courting period. I know we were supposed to do that before we got married, but I think we can both use a little sparking. I think I like that idea a lot. Beatrice had never been courted. She'd always been the smart girl, and the boys hadn't been terribly interested in her. Now she was glad, because he was the first man to show her affection. No woman should ever touch a man she wasn't going to spend her life with. Good. He lowered his mouth to hers again. This time it lasted a little longer than the first. The press of his lips to hers left her feeling a bit dizzy. I like kissing you, Beatrice. She smiled. Good, because I like being kissed. Her hands rested on his shoulders. It's not wrong of me to tell you that, is it? Of course not. You can tell me anything. We're married after all. She hadn't thought of it that way, and wasn't sure if she was ready to. Some things felt easier to talk to another lady about. She'd see, though. She'd definitely see. While Arthur was at work the following day, Beatrice took a long, hot bath, before carefully putting on her new dress. She'd made it the same size as usual, but it was a bit big in the waist, which made sense. She'd done a lot of walking to get to Colorado, and not all of it had been easy. She patiently brushed her hair dry in front of the stove, making the blonde curls shine. Looking at herself in the mirror above the dresser in the bedroom, she carefully twisted her hair atop her head, trying to look her very best. Her sweet husband had only ever seen her at her worst, yet still, he'd married her. She was careful not to get her dress dirty as she put the finishing touches on supper, planning to surprise him with her new clothes and a fine meal. Arthur walked into the house, sniffing deeply. My beautiful wife has outdone herself with supper again, I can tell. Beatrice smoothed her skirt and hurried out into the parlor to greet him. I did my best. You always do. He looked her up and down with a smile. 
you look particularly beautiful this evening. You've always looked lovely, but tonight, I swear it seems like an angel has come down from heaven to greet me. She laughed, moving close to him and raising her lips to his. You make me almost believe that I really am beautiful. In my eyes, you're everything. His kiss was tender and sweet all at once. Now feed me, woman. She wrinkled her nose. It's my cooking you think is beautiful, not me. That's not true at all. It's both. Through the weekend, Beatrice had a good time getting to know her husband. She and Arthur went on a picnic Sunday afternoon, and she couldn't have been happier. Still, the weight of her parents' deaths rested on her shoulders, and she felt guilty for being happy. After their picnic, she saw the woman who had talked to her and told her to get out of the wagon just before it tumbled over the side of the ravine. I'll be right back, she told Arthur, hurrying over to where the woman was standing watching her. Who are you? she asked, needing to know how this woman had known to save her. She'd been haunted by the memory of her, constantly wondering who had helped her. How did you know to tell me to get out of the wagon? Come to think of it, Beatrice hadn't seen the other woman get out of the wagon to save herself. I'm a friend, the stranger said softly. You may call me whatever you like. I can't just name you. That would be very strange. Why are you here? The woman seemed to be following her. Beatrice needed to know who she was. I want you to know that you don't have to feel guilty about not mourning your parents more. They understand that you have to move on with your life. Beatrice bit her lip. But I should be spending more time thinking about them. They died, and I got married the same day. How can that be right? The woman put a hand on her arm. It is right. I led you to Arthur, because I knew that he was the one you needed. The one who could make you happy. Why didn't you at least try to save my parents? That was the question that was really burning a hole in Beatrice's brain. Why couldn't all three of them have survived? Because it was their time to go. Not yours. The woman patted her arm. The angel of death was there for them. You saw him standing over them in the ravine. There was nothing I could have done to save them when they were meant to go. Go? Go where? You know where. Don't ask me silly questions. Will I see you again? Beatrice asked. Somehow, she felt connected to this woman. She didn't want to be a bother, but she needed to have her in her life, at least for a while. Yes, you'll see me. I'm assigned to you until we know you'll be happy, you're not sure? I thought you said that Arthur was the one who would make me happy. If you know that, then how do you not know if I'll be happy? The woman frowned for a moment, as if searching for the right words to explain things. We know Arthur has the ability to make you happy. You will make choices, though, and those decisions will determine if true happiness is possible for you. What kinds of choices? That's not for me to say. I'm sorry, Beatrice, there are some things that I can't help you with. You'll have to figure them out on your own, how do you know my name? Beatrice asked, her face confused. I know I never told you. The woman became more mysterious with every word she said. You didn't have to. You're my assignment. The woman patted her arm and turned to walk away. You should go be with Arthur now. He's a good man, and he's the right man for you. How can you be so sure? Beatrice called after her. No one could guarantee that someone was right for someone else. Only God himself had those answers. The woman smiled and raised a hand in a wave, before disappearing behind a tree. She was gone. Beatrice rushed after her, needing just a few more questions answered, but the woman was gone. Completely and utterly gone. Could she have just disappeared the way she'd seemed to appear in the wagon? Who was she? Why was Beatrice her assignment? Beatrice sighed. She wouldn't be getting her answers that day. She saw that Arthur was standing up beside their picnic blanket, seeming to look for her. She rushed back toward him, determined to say nothing about the woman she'd been speaking to. Could she be losing her mind after all? Chapter 4 When Beatrice got back to Arthur, he frowned at her. What were you doing over there for so long? 
She didn't ask if he'd seen anyone she was talking to, because she really didn't want to know. She was very afraid the woman was a figment of her imagination, and she didn't want proof of that fact. I was thinking. Talking. To yourself? She nodded, biting back a flippant answer. We should probably get home. I saw some strawberries over there, he said, waving off in a random direction. I would sure love to have some. She smiled. Like in a muffin? Or a pie, either would be acceptable. I just love my sweets. I don't know how you survived as a bachelor for so many years, she said with a grin, walking toward the berries. We don't have anything to really put them in except the picnic basket. That's fine. Use the picnic basket, and you can just wash them when we get home. She sighed. You're going to be a full-time job just to feed, aren't you? She was teasing, because she loved the idea of feeding him. She liked the way his face lit up when she fed him something new, or something he hadn't had for a while. So, everything. I might be. I'll try not to be too needy, but it's been so long since someone has made delicious meals and desserts for me. Are you trying to manipulate me? Beatrice asked, her eyes narrowed in suspicion. Is it working? Arthur gave her his best innocent grin, and she laughed. I'm sure it will. Why do I want to make you happy so badly? You're so much work. He caught her to him, kissing her softly. Because you know that I want to make you happy just as badly? That might be it. Never before had she met someone who could make her laugh so easily. Or tug at her heartstrings. Or make her sad. He had a lot of power over her, and she wasn't sure if she liked it. Not that she had a choice in the matter. After the basket was full of berries, he drove them both home in his buggy. It was a newer model buggy, and she loved it. She didn't feel the ruts in the road nearly as badly as she had in her father's wagon. Do you want me to make muffins for the men in the morning? Or cookies? He thought about it for a moment. I guess it wouldn't be Christian for me to say I want all the berries for myself, now would it? She laughed softly, probably not, but if you said it, I'd honor it. She loved the way he was so honest about his feelings. I'll share. Make muffins. Do you have any idea how many we'll need? He shrugged. Are you asking me how many men walk past our door on an average morning? How was he supposed to have any idea of the number? I guess that's what I'm asking. Do you have any idea? None at all. Probably somewhere between twenty and a hundred. Between twenty and a hundred? That's not even a guess. That's a ridiculously wide number. She shook her head at him, wishing he'd be a bit more specific. I guess you'll just have to prepare for a hundred, and if there are muffins left, I'll eat them. She groaned. I think I've created a monster. You sure have. Does it make you happy to know it? He stopped the buggy by pulling on the leads, then jumped down to go around and help her to the ground. Hurry into the house while I unhitch the horses and take the buggy to Otto and Bob in the livery. I don't like the idea of leaving you alone out here for even that long. Beatrice didn't question him. She hurried toward the house, the picnic basket over one arm. She wanted to get started right away on the muffins. She loved the idea that she would be starting to do good for her neighbors in the morning. It was something she'd soon be able to tell Millie about. By the time Arthur joined her in the kitchen, she'd mixed up the batter and was carefully ladling it into muffin tins. The chunks of strawberry added color to the batter, making it pretty. Arthur frowned at her. I'm going to get some of the muffins, right? I did help pick the strawberries. Yes, you'll get some of the muffins. She picked up a teaspoon and put a bit of the batter onto it. Here, try this. He opened his mouth as she pushed the spoon toward his mouth, taking the bite she offered. That's good. You don't even have to bake it as far as I'm concerned. I'm going to bake them. Can you imagine me giving out cups of batter? He shrugged. It would work for me. She laughed, shaking her head. You're awfully easy to please. I think you'll find that's a good thing as we get older. It occurred to her then that circumstance had made this man the one she'd grow old with. 
she belonged to him for the rest of her life, whether she liked it or not. She watched him as he sat sprawled in a kitchen chair, completely at home with her. I wonder what you'll look like as an old man. He shrugged. Probably a lot like I look now, but with gray hair and a grizzled beard that comes down to my waist. She laughed. I can't picture you with a beard like that. I can't picture you without a beard either, though. Maybe I should shave you, so I can see what your face looks like underneath all that scruffiness. He touched his beard, frowning at her. Do you have any idea how long it's taken me to grow this? I guess your beard is more important to you than these muffins. Are you telling me I get no muffins if I don't shave my beard? Have you lost your mind? She laughed, putting two muffin tins side by side into the oven. While those are baking, I'll wash our lunch dishes. What do you want for supper? He shrugged. I love everything you cook. I couldn't pick favorites, or you might not cook so many different things. You have no idea what variety means to me where food is concerned. Eating the same thing for every meal was about to make me absolutely crazy. I can understand that. We always had a variety of things to eat on the farm. What kind of farming did your father do? He raised corn and cows. He was a dairy farmer. I never thought he'd leave that land, and one day he just said he couldn't take it anymore, he was going to make his fortune in the gold mines. How did your mother react? She'd mentioned all this to him before, but he could tell she was still upset about the whole situation. Beatrice shrugged. She started packing. As far as I know, she never once voiced an opinion other than his. She never argued. She sighed. That's why I know I could never be a truly obedient wife. My mother had no say in anything, and I think she should have. I can understand that. Arthur frowned. I will always consult you on major decisions. Thank you. I need to be consulted. I'm an educated woman with a mind of my own. I can't imagine blindly following a man to do whatever he says, simply because I married him. She finished washing the last of the dishes, and was surprised to see him pick up the cloth to wipe them dry. You start supper. I'll dry these and put them away. Do you know where they go? She asked with mischief in her eyes. I do if you didn't change everything. Oh, believe me. Everything is different now. Absolutely everything. He frowned. And this is why some old men told me to never let a woman in my life. They were wrong, though, weren't they? How could you even survive without me here to smile at you every day? That's a really good question. I don't know how I made it here as a bachelor for seven years before you arrived. I came here as soon as I completed my training in Morse code. Will you teach me to use the telegraph? He looked startled. Teach you? Why? In case you ever come down sick. Or if you need a break for some reason. Then I can take over for you. As soon as you finish getting your dresses made and have the house like you want it, then we'll talk about it. She made a face at him. Every time my father told my mother they'd talk about something, it meant that the answer was no, and she needed to just forget it. I really do mean we'll discuss it. I want to see what things are like then. Perhaps by that point the women will have been found, and this town won't be as dangerous a place. Do you really think that's possible? He shrugged. I think anything's possible if you believe. She made a quick pot of soup for supper while she continually baked more and more muffins. He ate the first that came out of the oven, and his eyes closed with pleasure. These are even better than the muffins miss being made. Only because they're fresh from the oven. I used her recipe. You have a good touch with baking, Beatrice. Is there anything you're not good at? She thought for a moment. I'm not particularly good at tatting. I've tried and tried to learn, but I'm afraid all of my doilies will be plain. He laughed. Well, if that's the only thing you're not good at, I'm proud to be your husband. And you wouldn't be otherwise? Really? He laughed. I'm not going to say anything else, because I seem to be digging my own grave with my words. That's very smart of you. She turned her back to him, a big smile on her face. The man kept her smiling and happy. 
even in the face of her grief, she was feeling hopeful about her future. And it was all because of him, she said a quick, silent prayer, thanking God for sending Arthur into her life. And you just saw this woman again? There wasn't anyone but us there at the picnic. Or outside. Well, no women at least. Arthur worried that she was losing her mind for just a moment, but she was the most level-headed woman he'd ever been around. She was there. I watched her walk through a wagon, to get to me. She told me to go inside, said I had to go immediately. As I grabbed you and pulled you with me, I saw the angel of death again. I knew he was there for someone. I'm just glad it wasn't us. She sighed. I really do know how crazy this sounds, but it's true. I haven't said anything because I didn't want you to think I'd lost my mind. It's hard not to think that. Arthur studied her for a moment as she moved efficiently at the stove. She didn't seem to be given to fanciful thoughts, so it was odd that she would believe something like this so strongly. I believe that you believe it, and I believe that whatever it was saved our lives. That's all I can agree with for now. Thank you. For what? Not trying to find an asylum to take me to. She slid French toast and bacon onto two plates and carried them to the table. I believe she's my guardian angel. She hadn't been sure what to call the woman before, but as soon as the words passed her lips, she knew they were right. That sounds crazy, too. I know it does, but I don't know what else to think. No one else sees her. She saved my life twice now. After my parents died, she told me to walk to Creed, and she even told me which bench to sit on. She said that you were the man I'm meant to be with. Beatrice shrugged, not knowing how else to explain all that had happened. Well, I agree with her about something. He took her hand and kissed it. Let me know if you see her again. Otherwise, we're going to pretend we never had this conversation. She sighed. I wish I could pretend I've never seen any of these things. She rubbed her hands over her face, wanting to be able to scrub away memories. He reached over and rubbed her arm. I wish you could too. Just stay safe. I don't think my angel will let me get into trouble. I think I could go places without you. He shook his head adamantly. You're going to give your guardian angel gray hair with that kind of attitude. He believed that God could save people, but they needed to help him. If a person prayed for a job, but never went to apply for one, how could God help them? Her hair is already kind of gray. What exactly does she look like? Hmm, well, she's about sixty, with gray hair and these piercing blue eyes. She really is looking out for me as only my mother has before her. She frowned, trying to remember more details. And she's always wearing the same gray skirt and pink, ruffled blouse. Nope, never seen anyone in town who matches that description. He shook his head. It's my job to look out for you now. And I'm not going to let you put yourself in danger, guardian angel or no guardian angel. He finished his breakfast and stood up. Do you mind waiting on the dishes until after we've gone to the store? I'm going out the back way, so there's no chance we'll run into the trouble that was there. She was a bit concerned about how blasé he was acting over the whole shooting and murder in front of their home. Do you hear gunfire a lot? He shrugged. Once a week or so, that's the first time someone has been killed on my doorstep, though. You're acting like it happens every day. She took her shopping basket and followed him out the door. I want to get fabric for the pillows and curtains today, as well as food to last us a few days. You seem to think you need to eat three meals a day, every day. It gets tiring after a while. Really? Do you want me to take a turn cooking? His eyes were filled with humor as he asked. She laughed. Not at all. I prefer to have a variety in my meals. She reached for his hand as they walked. I honestly enjoy cooking for you. I like to see your face when I make something new. Her mother had always said it was a joy to serve the ones you loved, but before that day, she'd never seen it. Like every meal, then? You know how to cook a lot of things. I do. And I think I'm going to see if there's a recipe book at the store. If there is, I'll be able to cook even more things for you. You're spoiling me. 
Pretty soon, I'm going to expect to come home from work, to food on the table and a beautiful woman at the stove. He paused for a moment. Oh, wait. I think I'm already used to it. You'll have to keep spoiling me now. She grinned, walking into the mercantile after he opened the door. She watched as Arthur went to the counter, so she walked to the back of the store, straining her ears to see what she would hear them say. Do you know of any new women in town? Arthur asked. Older women, gray hair, blue eyes? Nope. The man who ran the mercantile had a deep voice and looked to be around fifty. Sounds like my kind of lady, though, so if you happen to see someone who looks like that, send her my way. Arthur laughed. Sorry, Mortimer, I haven't seen anyone like that. I heard tell someone who matches that description was in town before the shots this morning, but I didn't see her myself. Well, if you do see her, tell her I may wait in for her. Everyone in town knew that Mortimer was a widower. He and his son had run the mercantile together for ten years. Mortimer was ready to marry again, and he wasn't shy about it. You know I will. My wife is picking fabric for pillows and curtains. She's turning my house into a whole new place. And she can cook like a dream. You should come to supper one night, I promise I won't cook. Good, because I've had all the beans and cornbread I can stomach. Marriage seems to agree with you. Arthur grinned, patting his stomach, which was full of a delicious breakfast. It does. I had no idea how much I needed a woman to make my life better. I had been thinking about sending for a mail-order bride, but it felt strange writing a letter to some woman I've never met in Massachusetts. I've heard there's a woman in a town named Beckham, who matches up people who are happy for the rest of their lives. There's supposed to be a newspaper starting up in a month or two, and I might just stick an advertisement in it. I would love to have a wife to make me delicious meals. Beatrice bit her lip as she hurried to the front of the store, putting the two bolts of fabric she wanted on the counter. I need two yards of this and eight yards of this, she said, pointing to each bolt in turn. Beatrice, this is my friend, Mortimer Jackson. Mortimer, this is my wife, Beatrice. Beatrice smiled and nodded her head. It's nice to meet you. You as well. Mortimer grinned at her. I can see you've been very good for Arthur here. I try, she said softly. I invited Mortimer to supper. Tonight? Arthur asked. Beatrice nodded. That works out well for me. I'll fix something especially delicious. She looked at Mortimer. Oh, that reminds me. Do you have any recipe books here? I know how to cook a lot of things, but Arthur sure does like having something new every night. I think I do. Mortimer dug under the counter and found a book. Will this work for you? Beatrice took it, flipping through it quickly. In her cursory look, she found several recipes she'd never before made. Yes, this is wonderful. I'll take it. She wandered off again, searching through the food. It didn't take her long to have the counter piled high. This will work just fine, she said when she'd finished. Mortimer quickly rang everything up on his cash register, and Arthur paid him. They walked home the same way they had the previous week, with each of them carrying an overflowing wooden box. I'm not sure we can keep buying this much every week. Our house is going to have things falling out the window soon, she gave him a cheeky grin. You should give me a budget, then. I'm perfectly capable of sticking to a budget. She wouldn't always be buying the way she had been, either. She was only buying so much to get the house set up how she wanted it. I can't do that. It's too fun to see what you'll buy and what you'll make from the purchases. She laughed, shaking her head. You shouldn't complain, then, should you? I guess not. After he'd put his box on the kitchen table, he kissed her cheek. I'll see you at lunchtime. I'll make something. She didn't know what, but she always came up with something. She knew that he wasn't a picky eater, so it was easy to please him where food was concerned. She spent the morning baking bread and putting on a soup for lunch. It was so easy to just stick a pot full of ingredients on the stove and let it cook until he was ready for his lunch. He never complained about having soup for lunch every day. 
After lunch that day, there was a knock at the door, and she hurried over to see who it was. Archie. She shrank away from the door, refusing to open it. There was something about the man that made her skin crawl. No way would she face him without Arthur at her side. There was another knock, this time louder. I know you're in there. She stayed perfectly still, hoping he wouldn't hear her moving around at all. She wasn't about to answer the door. He was the man she got the worst feelings from. After he'd left, she opened the door connecting the house to Arthur's office. Mr. Grady just came by and pounded on the door, she told Arthur once she had his attention. He knocked for a long time, even calling out that he knew I was there. Were you frightened? She nodded emphatically. I was very frightened. And I didn't open the door. She shivered, rubbing her arms to ward off the chill Archie had made her feel. Good. I wouldn't want you to. Well, look who's here, Archie Grady said from the doorway. Does your pretty little wife spend a lot of time in your office while you're working, Arthur? Archie's eyes went to Beatrice, and he looked at her in a way only a husband should look at a wife. Only when she sees something slimy, then she comes over and asks me to protect her from it. Arthur met the other man's eyes dead on. He knew Archie would know he was being insulted, but Arthur just didn't care. Archie's uncle may own the town, but Arthur was not going to kowtow to him. Beatrice stood behind Arthur while he talked, keeping her head down. She knew Archie would take it as a subservient gesture, but really it was to keep him from seeing her anger. She wanted to throw something at the man, but she didn't need to get a reputation for having a temper. Arthur took the hand that rested on his shoulder, giving her strength. Did you need to send a telegram, Mr. Grady? If the man wasn't there to conduct business, he could get out of his office. Archie frowned and shook his head. Not at the moment, I don't. Then is there a reason you stopped by my office? Something else I can help you with? No. I'll be going. Archie's eyes lingered on Beatrice as he left the office. I don't like him, Beatrice said unnecessarily. No one does, my dear. No one does. Supper that evening was a fun time for Beatrice. Mortimer, as he insisted she call him, was full of interesting stories. He'd fought for the South in the war between the states, and he talked about how awful the war was. He went into great detail about his journey west, made on foot, because trains weren't as readily available at that time. He talked about his wife and son, and she listened eagerly to every word because his voice was full of love when he talked about his marriage. In Mortimer's eyes, his wife had been nearly perfect, and he loved to tell everyone about her. After he'd left, she did the dishes, then went in search of Arthur, finding him exactly where she expected him to be, in the parlor, reading silently. She took her spot beside him on the sofa, her sewing basket at her feet. If Mortimer came to the door while you were at work, should I open the door? She felt very comfortable with the man and would happily allow him in. Arthur eyed her for a moment before silently shaking his head. I like Mortimer, and we've been friends for a long time, but I can't fully trust him or any other man in this town until I know who's behind the disappearances. You don't even trust Mortimer? She was surprised. They'd seemed like such close friends to her. He's probably my best friend in this whole town, but no, I don't trust him. Not where you're concerned. I found myself a precious jewel, and I can't trust any man who might be a thief. He couldn't imagine allowing her to be alone with any man. They would all love her just as much as he did. How could they not? She shook her head at him. I think you may value me too highly, I don't think I could put a value on you. You are my wife. No, there's no value that's too high. He showed her the book he was reading. Have you read Little Women? She nodded. It's been a favorite of mine for many years. This is the sequel. Little Men. I haven't read that one. She was excited at the very idea of a new book by Louisa May Alcott. Then pick up your sewing and I'll get to reading it. He opened the book to the first chapter cleared his throat, and started reading. Beatrice found herself lost in the words of a writer she greatly admired. She'd always thought she could be a writer herself, but it had never quite worked out for her, 
though the passion was there. Over an hour and three chapters later, he closed the book. I'm afraid I need to stop there. I'm more tired than usual tonight. My wife forced me to risk my life, handing out muffins to strangers this morning. Did you find out who died? she asked softly. She'd tried not to think of the shooting all day, but his words brought it back to her. I didn't know the man. He was here for the summer, working. There were a lot of men who drifted through town for a while, then left again. Someone needs to notify his family. That was my job earlier today. I sent them a telegram. Will there be a funeral? She knew she was showing an inordinate amount of interest in the death of a stranger, but after her parents' deaths, she felt the need to do something for this man. I don't know. I would like to have one, if you don't mind. I will make food for a reception after, but everyone should have the right to pay their last respects. Arthur nodded, he could see it was important to her, and he felt strongly enough for her that he couldn't imagine telling her no. All right. I'll wire Reverend Bing. Thank you. She was pleased he didn't question her need to do it and simply went along with it. He was better to her than she deserved. Chapter 6 Shortly after lunch the following day, there was a knock on the door again. At first Beatrice froze, and then she crept softly to the door to see who was there. When she saw Millie with her brother, she opened the door wide. It's so good to see you. She couldn't believe how relieved she was to see her friend there at the door. It's good to see you too, Millie said, throwing her arms around Beatrice and hugging her tightly. What are you doing here? Beatrice asked, thankful to see her friend, but not sure why she was there. I told you I'd come see you when I could, Callum was called into town about a man who died needing a funeral, so I thought I'd visit you. I'm glad you're here. I said I'd cook for a reception after the funeral, and I have a feeling I'm going to need an extra pair of hands. Beatrice was willing to work through the night if necessary, but it would be so much easier with her friend's help. Callum nodded to her. It's good to see you again, Mrs. Jameson. I'll go and talk to Arthur for details on what happened, and the man who died. After he'd left, Beatrice shut and locked the door. What shall we cook? she asked Millie, linking her arm with her friends. Most of the men in this town crave sweets. There's no baker around, so if they're not married, they miss out on baked goods. We should bake a few cakes, some cookies, and a pie or three. Millie looked over at Beatrice. I love your new dress. You sure do look different than when I was here last week. That's because I'm clean and my clothes aren't torn. Beatrice shook her head. I can't believe I let anyone see me that way. I didn't have a choice, but I'm very embarrassed about it now. She knew she hadn't looked the slightest bit respectable. Arthur shouldn't have looked twice at her. Don't be. You're still the same person inside. We loved you before and we'll love you now. Millie took Beatrice's second apron off a hook and pulled it on over her dress. We might want to make a huge pot of stew as well as the baked goods. I think the men would appreciate that. When is your brother planning to do the funeral? When? Probably tomorrow morning. He's here for information today, so I insisted I get to come along and see my friend. He couldn't say no to me when I offered to make him his favorite dessert if he brought me along. Beatrice laughed. You're bribing a man of God? Let me step away from you, lest you be struck by lightning. Millie giggled. He's easily bribed with sweets, though I'm not sure if I'll tell anyone else that. It's probably not something anyone should know about the good Reverend Bing. The two women dove into their baking, working together as if they'd done it a thousand times before. This reminds me of cooking with my mother, Beatrice said sadly for a moment. We cooked together so often that we could almost read each other's minds as to what to do next. I'm sorry if that makes you sad. Soon you'll think of your mother, and the memories will bring a smile to your face instead of tears. I hope so. Beatrice worked for a while in silence. Tell me about your life. Where did you grow up? She couldn't believe she'd told Millie so much about her own past, but she hadn't asked any questions of her friend. She'd needed to talk, and Millie had been a welcoming ear, Scotland. Callum has all but raised me, and he's a good brother to me. 
I love it here, because I get to be part of his ministry. I can understand that. Beatrice put a cake into the oven and closed it. I'm going to sew for ten minutes so I have a break and not be on my feet as much. How's that ankle of yours? I know you were limping a little last week. It's better. I did so much sewing last week that I just wasn't on my feet like I would be most days. It's not bothering me at all anymore. I'm glad. And I really do love the new dress. It's pretty, but modest as well. What more could you ask for in a dress? Where will the funeral take place? Beatrice asked. There's not a church here in town, is there? Not that she'd seen much of the town, but if the nearest place to go to service was Bachelor, she knew there couldn't be one in Creed. There is. It's not used because the last minister was too afraid to stay here any longer. He preached one too many sermons on the evils of alcohol and was sent death threats. He decided it was time to go. Millie shook her head. It's sad, because that minister was a good friend of my brother's, he's missed him something fierce since he left. That's very sad. So we'll have the funeral in the church here? Does it need to be cleaned? Beatrice couldn't imagine having a funeral in a filthy church. Millie nodded. I suspect it does need a good cleaning. Do you want to do that today? Beatrice shook her head. I promised Arthur that I won't leave the house without him. He's worried something will happen to me because of the three women who have disappeared recently. Three? It was two last I heard. We need to pray for those women to be found quickly. I agree, I pray for them every day. Beatrice frowned. I suppose I'll have to wait until Arthur comes home to clean the church. I would rather get it done with, but I understand his fears, and I won't break my word to him. She needed there to be trust in her marriage. Millie smiled at her. You're a good wife to him. I know few wives who would honor that wish from their husbands. I will try to always honor my husband's wishes. I may not always agree with them, and I'll voice my opinion when I don't, but I will try to be an obedient wife, when it suits me, of course. Beatrice grinned at her friend. Millie laughed. I'm not sure you're reading the scriptures right on that one. Will we sing at the funeral? I'm not sure. Probably not, because we never have before. Callum tries to keep funerals and weddings short and sweet, not making people sit around any longer than necessary. Do you know what he told me once? Beatrice shook her head. No, what? He said he'd rather preach at a funeral than a wedding. He knows how the funeral turned out, but he's unsure about the wedding. That's awful. Beatrice had never heard such a thing. I know. He says it's true, though. Now, of course he does his job and marries people when they ask. Like he married you and Arthur. He's a good pastor. I'm sure he is. He was even the one to suggest I marry Arthur. The thought certainly hadn't crossed my mind, and I doubt that it had Arthur's. But I think we're going to be happy together. Based on her own experience and on what the strange woman had said to her, Beatrice was positive they would be very happy. I think it's wonderful that it's working out for the two of you. I know you only married because you were alone here with nowhere to go. But you seem to have developed genuine affection for each other. Beatrice smiled. We really have. We have a great deal in common. He reads to me every night while I sew, which is wonderful. I love to read, but I need to keep my hands busy. With his help, I can do both together. It had become her favorite time of day, sitting with him on the sofa and listening to him read. I read my Bible, but I haven't ever really read for pleasure. Callum and I make sure we read our Bible every day, though. Well, I've read the Bible as well, several times through. But I do prefer to read fiction. I love a story that will take me away from the real world and transport me to a place where I love to be. Beatrice closed her eyes, imagining the world of one of her favorite books. Millie smiled. I think we're going to need to agree to disagree on the subject of reading, then. You stick with fiction, and I'll keep reading my Bible. That's a great idea. Beatrice didn't mind that they didn't have reading in common. Now that she'd found Arthur, 
who read the same way she did, she was content to have other friends who didn't share the interest. She stood up. I think it's time for me to get back to work. Another cake needs to be made. How many people do you think will go to the funeral? Everyone. A funeral and a wedding are the biggest parties around. People who never even met him will be there, acting as if they loved him for years. Is that normal? Beatrice had never heard of such a thing. Millie shrugged. I don't know if it's normal, but it's what's done around here. You'll see how it goes, I guess I will. Most of the baking was done by the time Arthur and Callum joined them later. I would like to clean the church tonight, Beatrice told Arthur. I've been told it isn't used regularly, and I don't think it's fitting to hold a funeral in a filthy church. Arthur looked at Callum and received a nod. We'll take you over, and the four of us will do it together. Quickly. There was safety in numbers, and he was happier to go as a group of four than a couple. Are you worried something will happen? Beatrice asked, her eyes wide. I want the Bings to be able to get home before it's dark, so we want to hurry. Arthur felt that answer was the easiest. He didn't like being out after dark there, but he didn't want her to worry more than she already did. Beatrice nodded. I've cooked enough for supper for them to stay and eat with us, if there's time. If there's not, I'll send some with them so Millie won't have to worry about cooking when they get home. She grabbed some rags and her broom. Let's go do this. We don't have time to scrub, but at least we can get the dust off everything. Arthur carried the broom, and Callum carried the rags. Millie led the way, with Beatrice at her side. I was telling Beatrice about the funeral being more of a party than anything else, Millie said. Callum nodded. It's strange, but I've noticed the same thing. People will come without even knowing the deceased, wanting to eat the food after and just enjoy a gathering. It's odd, but that's the way it is here. Arthur shrugged. I'm rarely able to go to a funeral. In fact, I won't be able to go tomorrow. I'll be working all day, as usual. Callum, will you be certain Beatrice arrives home safely afterward? I'll walk her over before I start work. I will. Callum smiled over at Beatrice. I think you two getting married was a stroke of genius on my part. You two seem to be very happy together. Arthur smiled. I'm married to a beautiful, intelligent woman who knows how to cook. What more could a man ask for in life? Millie grinned as she looked at Arthur. He does seem to be more than a little taken with you. I'm afraid the feelings are mutual. We really are good together, better than I ever dreamed we could be as I was saying my vows. You were still in shock after your parents' deaths. For me, I wish Callum had found a way to bring you home with him. For you, I'm glad you and Arthur found each other. I could use a dear friend who lived closer to me, but that's just me being selfish. I understand how you feel. I wish there were more women around who I could spend time with. Beatrice linked her arm with Millie's. I guess I just need to make the most of the time I have to spend with you. She'd had one best friend the whole time she was growing up and she had never needed another. If Millie was going to be her best friend here, she'd be content with that. My brother has taken steps to try to get more good women in town. I'm not sure if it will work, but I certainly hope so. We could use more women, both in Bachelor and here in Creed. I do hope it works. It would be lovely to have quilting circles and a relief society. I believe it will eventually happen but it may not be in our lifetimes, as sad as that is to say. Millie shrugged. We do some quilting after church on Sundays, but since you can't come to Bachelor, you don't get to be part of that. Maybe I'll ask Arthur to bring me this weekend. I can't make any promises, but I would dearly love to be there for services. Beatrice was nervous at the idea, but she'd have to face that road some time. I would love to have you. Don't do anything that will make it harder for you later though. You may need a month or two to be able to go down that path. I know I would having seen what you did. Beatrice nodded. I will see how I feel about it. I'm making no promises. They arrived at the church, and Callum opened the door. It was obvious the church had not been in use for months. Beatrice and Millie went to work immediately, chatting with one another as they did. 
Callum and Arthur each took a rag and helped dust off the pews. Callum paid particular attention to the podium at the front. He wanted his space to be clean when he preached the following day. It took a little over an hour for the women to be satisfied that the church was clean enough, and they made the walk back to the Jameson's house in silence. They all ate the stew Beatrice had prepared before Millie and Callum climbed into their buggy and headed back to Bachelor for the night. After they'd gone, Beatrice looked at Arthur. I wish our house was just a little bit bigger, so I could invite them to stay the night. Then they wouldn't have to face that treacherous path twice, before I see them in the morning. She said a quick, silent prayer for the safety of her friend and Callum. Maybe we'll add on someday. Probably not this summer, but maybe next. By next summer, Beatrice hoped to be expecting their first child. Or already have it in her arms. She wanted a little boy who looked just like Arthur. She would teach him to read, and he would enjoy their family time every evening with his father reading them a story. Where did you go? Arthur asked. You seem to have left me for a bit there. She blushed. I was thinking that by next summer, we could have our first child. I want a little boy who looks just like you. He smiled. That's funny, because I want a little girl who looks just like you. Maybe we could have both. He made a face. Not at the same time, I hope. That would be a lot of work for you. It would, but it would be double the blessing. God has already blessed me so much, by leading me to you. He can provide two more blessings in a year. She smiled at him, thinking about how wonderful it would be to have his children. He drew her to him, kissing her forehead. I want a houseful of children, too. Anything that would make you happy would please me. You're a good man, Arthur. I'm glad I was led to you. And whether he believed it or not, she had been. By your guardian angel? She shrugged. I think so. Who knows? Maybe it was just a ghost. Not that she believed in ghosts. Come to think of it, she didn't believe that angels walked among men. Either way was a stretch to her belief system. Just a ghost? I don't know that I would put it that way. She sighed. I'm going to do the dishes, then I'm going to bed. Tomorrow is going to be a busy day. I'll get the buggy ready in the morning, so I can take all these baked goods to the church. He looked around the kitchen, overwhelmed by the sheer amount of work she'd done for a total stranger. I thought people would come back here for the reception? Will we have it in the church? Yes, that's where we'll have it. Most have it in a home but I don't want you here with all those people. I would prefer you could leave when you were ready. The very idea of her being there alone, surrounded by strangers, made him very nervous. No, that wasn't going to happen. She nodded. All right. I'll be ready to go when you are. She walked back toward the dishes, glad that she and Millie had washed them while they baked. But there were still more dishes than she would like to do. The funeral was a shock for Beatrice. The others hadn't been lying when they'd talked about the funeral being a social event. The small church was packed with people that Beatrice knew hadn't darkened the door of a church in decades. She looked at Millie and said, Do all these people always come to funerals? Millie shrugged. I told you. Everyone comes. It's very odd to me. I don't go to funerals unless I happen to be close to the person who has passed. After the funeral, Millie and Beatrice served the men who had come for the occasion. There were only two other women there, and they were dressed in a way that left Beatrice with no question as to their profession. They were obviously ladies of the evening. Beatrice served them both with a smile, letting them know that she was new in town and was pleased to make their acquaintance. Millie was slightly shocked at how friendly she was. You know who they are, don't you? They are women who entertain men for money. Beatrice couldn't think of a nicer way to say it. I don't think we should be rude to them. We don't know why they do what they do. What if they were forced into that profession? If they hate what they do and have us looking down on them, well that makes it even harder. No, I think all people should be treated with love and respect. It's the way of a Christian. Millie smiled at her. You know, sometimes I think you are more in touch with your Christianity than I am. You are not judgmental at all. 
and I have to say, that's a fault of mine. I look at some people and judge them through and through. We all have faults to work on. Beatrice said a silent prayer that Millie wouldn't ask her worst fault. She wasn't sure if believing she had a guardian angel was truly a fault, or if it was just an idiosyncrasy, but either way, she wasn't eager to announce her visions. I'm not going to ask yours, Millie said with a smile. If you ever want to tell me, you may, but I'm afraid I would judge you if you told me. Beatrice laughed, serving another bowl of the stew to another man who looked like he had crawled out of a mine and come to the funeral as he was. How did you know Arnold Scott? she asked, wondering if there was a connection for this man. The man shrugged. I talked to him once when he first come to town. I see. The man walked on, and Beatrice was left wondering. She was willing to bet most people in the little church had never even met the man. When people started leaving, Beatrice looked at Millie. All the food is gone. They ate everything. Ten hours of slaving in the kitchen had been demolished in less than an hour by the ravenous crowd. They're not used to real baked goods. Millie shrugged. And now we have dishes to do. Lots and lots of dishes. We'll handle them, Beatrice said. At least poor Arnold got a proper send-off. She was happy with the part she'd played in making sure the man had the burial everyone deserved. Poor Arnold, one of the men from across the room asked. He drew first, he was shot, but it wasn't in cold blood, and he sure deserved it. Beatrice shrugged. He still deserved a proper burial, and I for one, am glad he got it. She refused to speak ill of the dead, and she preferred when others didn't around her. It made her uncomfortable. He did, Callum said, putting his hand on Beatrice's shoulder. Are you ready to go home? Beatrice nodded. I just need to get all these dishes to the buggy so I can take them home, then spend the next three months washing them. She rubbed the back of her neck, already sore from the work she was about to do. Callum smiled. I'll take you to your house on our way back to Bachelor. Thank you, Beatrice said sweetly, happy she wouldn't have to walk home. She was already exhausted after so much time on her feet. I didn't cook lunch. Don't worry about Arthur. Callum said. I took him a bowl of stew before you ran out. He'll be just fine. I can't believe I forgot to feed my husband. What kind of wife am I? Beatrice shook her head in self-disgust. Arthur had to be her first priority. Millie grinned. You're a busy wife. And busy people forget things at times. Don't worry, he'll forgive you. Callum nodded. Of course, he will. I told him you wanted me to bring the stew. And if you'd thought of it, I'm sure you would have wanted me to bring it. I would have. Thank you, Callum. Beatrice was thrilled that the man had thought of what she'd forgotten. You're very welcome. Beatrice realized then that she'd started to think of the reverend the same way his sister did. She hoped it wasn't offensive that she'd used his first name so casually. I mean Reverend Bing. There aren't enough people who call me Callum. You are welcome to use my first name. It's nice to hear it at times. It's easy to lose myself in being a reverend and stop being the man. Then Callum it is. I thank you for the funeral, and for the use of your sister, and so many other things. You've been a true friend to me. Callum smiled. You bring joy to those around you, lass. We're pleased to have you here. Beatrice wasn't sure if she really brought joy to people, but it was nice to hear. She nodded her thanks before carrying a load of dishes out to the preacher's buggy. Chapter 7 After she was dropped off, Beatrice locked her door, knowing that was what Arthur wanted her to do. She, Millie, and Callum had carried in dishes, and now she needed to set to washing them. First, she started a pot of soup on the stove, and then she started the long, laborious task of washing all the dishes. Thankfully, Millie had brought dishes from her home as well, so there was enough for all of the people at the funeral, some of whom had never met the deceased. She wasn't half through with the dishes when Arthur came to make sure she'd made it home all right, and she gladly took a break to sit with him. How was the funeral? he asked. She shrugged. Very different. I've never been to a funeral with so many people, 
all of whom just cared about the food involved. Welcome to Creed. Arthur grinned at her, accepting the cookies she put in front of him. She frowned at him. Does anyone know who shot the man? She'd already forgotten his name, even though she'd been the one to plan his funeral. Archie. He took a bite of his cookie, everyone knows it's him, but no one is willing to go to the sheriff, because everyone thinks the sheriff is in Archie's uncle's pocket. It's sad. What do you think? she asked. He shrugged. I don't know what to think. I don't really know the sheriff, and sometimes it seems as if Archie gets away with stuff he shouldn't, but there's no real proof either way. I think everyone assumes that he's crooked, and they don't feel like they can compete with Archie's uncle's money. Why doesn't everyone get together and report the sheriff? She couldn't understand why people just allowed things to go on as they were, instead of trying to make changes. I really don't think there's an answer to that. Most people in Creed don't care what other people are doing. They mind their own business. I wish I could be that way sometimes. She shook her head. No you don't. You care, and that's a very good thing. It's one of my favorite things about you. She couldn't imagine Arthur without his caring attitude. He would be a completely different man. Oh? One of your favorites? What's your very favorite? He grinned at her, waiting for an answer. She shrugged. It's a toss-up between the way you ride to the rescue of women you find crying on benches, and the way you kiss me. Is that so? Beatrice refused to be embarrassed. It is so. Does that shock you? Shock me? No. Make me extremely happy? It does that. He reached out and took her hand in his. I think after all those dishes are done, you should stay off your feet for the rest of the day. Your ankle isn't totally healed yet. My ankle? You know about my ankle? She thought she'd done a good job of hiding it. You limped into town, and then the first week we were married, you were careful not to let me see you limping. Yes, I know about your ankle. Be careful with it, would you? I'm doing my best to be careful. She frowned at him. Why didn't you say anything? You made it clear that you didn't want me to know, so I didn't feel the need to bring it up. He pulled his pocket watch from his vest pocket, glancing at the time. I need to go. Time for me to work some more. He leaned down and kissed her softly. I'll see you in a few hours. Just the soup for supper, all right? She nodded, watching him leave. The man surprised her a little bit more every day. Of course, they'd only known one another for a little over a week, but still, she felt like she knew him quite well most of the time. She stood up and started working on the dishes again, hopeful that she could finish with enough time to finish her curtains that day. It was nice to feel like she had the right to take the afternoon off. Over supper that evening, Beatrice said, I think I want to do cookies for the men on Monday. I meant to do that this week, but the strawberries were too big of a temptation. Arthur put his spoon down, looking at her with surprise. You don't actually think you're going to pass out sweets again, do you? There were shots this week. She was losing her mind if she thought he was going to let her do that. But that was Archie. He probably had a vendetta. I'm sure everything will be totally safe this week. She truly wasn't concerned, and it didn't make sense to her that he was. I'm not so sure. I don't want you passing out treats again until this town is safer. We can't risk our lives so you can wish people a happy Monday. It's not safe. But it was the only way I was around people other than you. I thought we were doing it together, so I could get to know people in town. We were. We're not now. Your life means a whole lot more to me than how many people you know in town. We'll continue to go on Sunday picnics, but I'm not going to let you risk your life every Monday morning while you pass out cookies. She frowned at him. You're not going to give me a choice? He shook his head adamantly. I'm not. This is one of those things I'm going to have to put my foot down on. Beatrice couldn't believe he was being so stubborn about this. It wasn't his right to make those choices for her. It was hers. I don't know why you think it's okay for you to tell me I can't do something you've already said was fine. That's not right. 
circumstances have changed. Now I'm worried about your safety if you do it, so you can't. Surely, she could understand he was making this decision for her protection. So, I'm once again a prisoner in your home. It's our home. You've done a lot to make it yours. Maybe I have, but this still isn't fair. My only friend here lives too far away for us to visit every day, and that leaves me home alone almost all the time. She frowned at him. I really need more to do. She was getting so frustrated with being cooped up in the house all day. She needed to do more. Without his books, she'd be going slowly insane. You're not even finished with the pillows and curtains for the parlor yet. Why not work on those things, and keep yourself busy that way? I can take a basket of cookies to work for you, but I just can't worry about you on Monday mornings. It's too hard. Are you allowing me out of the house, to go to the mercantile with you in the morning? Or am I restricted from that now too? She was so tired of being alone all the time. It was really making her crazy. No, I'll take you in the morning. I know you need out, and we'll even talk to Mortimer while we're out. She sighed. If Mortimer had a wife, that would give me someone to do things with. Yes, it would. But he doesn't, so you're going to have to get used to not having people with you all the time. I'm sorry, but that's the way it has to be. He wiped his mouth and set his napkin on the table. And I'd appreciate it if you only did laundry on Sundays when I'm home with you as well. After he'd left the room, she rested her head on the table. Their first argument. She knew it wouldn't be their last. Married people didn't always see eye to eye and arguments were inevitable. She knew the right thing to do was to apologize, but she didn't want to. Not yet anyway. She needed to be mad for a little while. It was good for her. The following morning, Beatrice woke up, feeling contrite. She never should have gone to bed angry with Arthur, and she knew it. She went into the kitchen and used the last of the strawberries they'd picked together to make him some muffins to go with his scrambled eggs and bacon. When he walked into the kitchen, his face was wary, and she finished putting their food on their plates, and then she walked over to him, wrapping her arms around his waist. I'm sorry. Her frustration with the situation didn't need to be taken out on him. It wasn't his fault. He kissed the top of her head. I am too. I can't change my decision, but I'm sorry that it makes you unhappy. I'll survive. It's more important that we both make it through the summer alive than me becoming a social butterfly. Not that she needed to be one, but being able to walk outside on occasion would be very nice. It is. Do you have a shopping list of what you need from the store today? He asked. I do. I think I want to add some yarn and knitting needles to it. I'd love to be able to make you a scarf for winter. I'd like that. He took her hand in his, praying over their meal. You're a good wife to me, and I'm sorry I can't give you everything you want. I wish I could. I know it can't be fun being home alone all the time, but hopefully some of the things Reverend Bing is doing will work out, and there will be more women in town soon. Then you can have your knitting circle. She laughed. Quilting circle. I've never heard of a knitting circle. Well, you could form the first. Wouldn't that be something? He didn't understand why there would be a quilting circle and not a knitting circle. Weren't they basically the same thing? The first knitting circle? I'm not sure. I'd rather go down in history for being the woman who turned this town around and made it a place where people could live in peace. Arthur sighed. I do wish you could do that. I do too. Maybe Millie and I can do it together. Along with whatever other women come to town. She frowned. Well, the ones who don't get kidnapped. I don't think the kidnapped women would be all that interested in helping us. Kidnapped? He asked, frowning at her. Do you know something I don't know? All I know is women have disappeared. If they've been kidnapped, that's something else entirely. Who could she have heard more about the topic from? Callum or Millie? She didn't see anyone else. Well, isn't either kidnapping or murder the obvious conclusion? I refuse to think they're dead, so they must have been kidnapped. I hope they haven't been harmed. 
For some reason, Beatrice felt an affinity for those missing women in a way that made little sense. She wished she could explain it, but there had been a lot of things in her life lately that she had no way to explain. Perhaps it was because she could have ended up missing as well if Arthur hadn't married her. I hope you're wrong. I want to think they all wandered out of town and got lost. They're sitting together in a cabin somewhere, laughing, joking, and enjoying life. They can't be heard anywhere. Arthur shrugged, grinning at her. If they were lost, then they were unharmed. I thought I was an optimist. With ideas like that, you should write children's books. Don't they always end in happily ever after? she asked with a smile. If they don't, they should. Arthur told her. Maybe you're right. I'll make my fortune in children's books. Beatrice frowned at the word fortune. You don't worry about making a fortune, do you? You're content with your life as it is? She hated the idea that he might go chasing after the almighty dollar in the same way her father had. Look where it had landed him. I'm very content. Especially since you've come into my life. I don't mind coming home anymore, because there's someone here waiting for me. Usually with a hot meal. You're the best thing to happen to me in a whole lot of years, Beatrice. I hope you know that. She smiled at him. I feel the same way. I enjoy being with you. Thank you for being the knight in shining armor who rescued me from who knows what. After they'd finished breakfast, they walked to the mercantile together, gathering the things she needed. Mortimer watched them from behind the counter, a wistful look on his face. When Arthur joined him, he said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to write to that matchmaker in Massachusetts. I need a bride. Do you think she could find someone just like your Beatrice? Or like my Grace? I think God broke the mold after them. Arthur watched as his wife rushed toward him, more purchases in her basket. If you're going to write, do it in a hurry, would you? My wife needs a friend who lives here in town. She has Millie, but she doesn't get to see her enough. I'll write to her today, so the letter can leave by tomorrow's train. Thanks, my friend. Arthur took the armload of supplies from Beatrice. Is there anything else you need? He was glad that he had saved up money before marrying. His new wife sure needed a lot of things. She grinned, shrugging sheepishly. Every time we come here, I see more things that I think I need. You'll be happy to know that I use them all, though. He put the things on the counter for Mortimer to ring up. That does please me. He looked through the things she'd selected. You are buying things to make me more sweets, right? Of everything he loved about Beatrice, her ability to make sweets was high on the list. Beatrice laughed. Of course I am. I know you need your sweets. It had become a joke between them that he wouldn't be able to make it through a day without one of her treats. Mortimer looked at Beatrice. Maybe you could make some of your baked goods for the store. I'm sure I could sell them, and I'd split the profits with you. Beatrice looked at Arthur, waiting for him to say no. He didn't seem to want her doing anything. When he stayed silent, she smiled. I like that idea a great deal. What kind of sweets would you like? It would be good to have something to do for others. Not really a job, but she'd be making money, so maybe it would be a job. Yes, she loved the idea. The man shrugged. I would think any baked goods would be easy to sell. We don't get a lot of that around here unless we happen to know how to make them ourselves. Bread, muffins, cookies, cakes, or pies. Some or all of them. They won't last long. I could bake all day and drop them off in the mornings. Arthur frowned. Could you perhaps pick them up from the telegraph office in the mornings? I could take a crate with me every day for you to come and get. I don't see why not, Mortimer said. It's not a far walk for me. Beatrice was a bit disappointed that she wouldn't get to walk to the store every morning, but she was still happy to have something to keep her occupied. There were only so many times she could scrub the floors before the task made her want to rip her hair out. Something to do to make a little money and make the people of town happier? That sounded wonderful. I can have your first crateful ready tomorrow morning, Beatrice told him. She'd get right to work as soon as she was home. 
you make a list of everything you're including, and keep a copy for yourself. We'll see what sells and what doesn't. Beatrice nodded excitedly, hurrying away to get more sugar, flour, and brown sugar. When she got back to the counter, Arthur just smiled and paid for it all. You might need to deliver this load, he said to Mortimer. No problem. I'll have it there within the half hour. Bring it to my office, Arthur said. As they walked away, he told Beatrice, you can pick it up from my office. Then you won't be in any kind of danger. He knew it was strange that he didn't even trust Mortimer with her, but something held him back from trusting anyone where she was concerned. She nodded, having expected him to say that. She'd never heard of a man who kept such a tight rein on his wife, but she understood that he did it for her protection, whether she wanted to be protected or not. That morning, before she went to pick up her supplies, she was washing the breakfast dishes when she noticed that the strange woman was standing beside her. Are you my guardian angel? Beatrice asked, feeling that she needed to just ask it straight out. She needed to know who this person was and why she was always there to see her. If that's how you want to think of me, but is that what you are? Why wouldn't she just say things straight out? I'm an angel, the woman said. And I've been thinking about the name thing. I know you need something to call me, so I thought Gabriella would work. Do you like that name? Like a feminine version of the angel Gabriel? Beatrice shrugged. I guess it works as well as anything. You must stop arguing with your husband about keeping you cooped up inside. It hurts him, and he is only doing what he thinks is best for you. Gabriella looked at her warningly, but is it what's best for me? How could it be, when it was making her a little bit crazy? I believe it is. There are many dangers in this town that are not apparent to you. You see some of them, but not them all. I need you to heed your husband's warnings, and stay inside when he's not with you. Beatrice sighed. Where are the missing women? If Gabriella was an angel, surely she knew. That's not a way in which I'm allowed to interfere. Will you at least tell me if they're alive or dead? Beatrice wanted to help them if there was any way to do so. It's not my place to do so. Gabriella picked up a dishcloth and started wiping the dishes dry. I think you need to occupy yourself with this new job of yours and stop worrying about getting out of the house. You will get out when the time is right, and not before. I will do my best. Beatrice shrugged. It's all I can do not to go outside sometimes, just to soak up the warm spring air, or to meet some of the people who walk past. I hate that I'm not allowed to give out treats any longer. No more treats. Without my interference, you'd have been taken by the angel of death on Monday. You must be more careful. Listen to your husband. Gabriella wiped the last dish and put it into the cabinet. Goodbye, Beatrice. Wait. Will you not come to me again? Only if you need me. And with that, Gabriella walked into the parlor. When Beatrice chased after her, she was gone. Beatrice walked back to the kitchen, just a bit befuddled by the most recent of her visits with Gabriella. The name seemed to fit the older woman. She glanced at the clock and realized it was time for her to go pick up her supplies, so she opened the door that led to Arthur's office. He wasn't alone, so she waited patiently, her hands folded demurely in front of her. She didn't want to be noticed by any man except her husband. After the man left Arthur's office, she hurried to him. Are my supplies here? Arthur laughed. I've never known a woman who was quite as eager to work as you are. He watched as she hurried over and picked up the first crate, carrying it into the kitchen. You do know that I get a 10% tax on all things made in my kitchen, right? She frowned at him. You want some of the money I make? She was happy to give it to him, but she was surprised. No, I want some of the goodies you bake. You and your sweet tooth. She carried the last box into the kitchen and hurried back to close the door. I'm sorry I disturbed you. You always disturb me. Her eyes widened. I do? Not in the way you mean, though. He winked at her, and watched as she snapped the door closed, her cheeks flaming. Beatrice put all of the supplies away, and then she sat down and made a list of the things she would make for the next day. 
because no one expected there to be baked goods at the mercantile, she should just make a few things this first day. She would gradually increase them as time went by. She frowned, thinking hard. First, she'd make six loaves of bread. If they were all sold, she'd make more the next day. Then she'd make three dozen cookies and two pies. She could add in a cake if that all went well. Keeping it simple for the first few days seemed smart to her. By lunchtime, she'd made a quick lunch for Arthur, had eight loaves of bread rising to be put into the oven, because they needed to keep two, and mixed up a batch of cookies. She also had two pie crusts rolled out, just waiting for the apple filling. She'd found dried apples and had decided to experiment with a pie. She was sure she could make it as tasty as it would be from fresh, with just a little effort. Arthur looked disappointed when he walked in. Nothing is ready yet? Beatrice shooed him away from her work table. Your lunch is ready. I was hoping for pie or cookies or cake or something. He looked around, a little lost that there were no sweets waiting for him. Eat your lunch. She shook her head at him. I'll have treats for you later. What's the good of having a wife that works on baking all morning if I have no cookies with my lunch? If you keep eating all the sweets you want, you're going to be as big as a house, Arthur Jameson. He sighed. We'll just have to exercise more. Do you want to go for a walk after work? I'd love to. Then will you bring me some sweets as soon as they're out of the oven? He asked sweetly, hoping she'd fall for his ploy. She laughed. I don't know what I'm going to do with you. He shrugged. I can give you some ideas if you want. He waggled his brows at her, letting her know exactly what he was thinking. I think I'll figure it out on my own, thank you very much. She laughed even as she felt the heat rising in her cheeks. Arthur smiled at her. I have a feeling I won't like your ideas as much as I do mine. Probably not. Chapter 8 The rest of Beatrice's day was spent baking. Before Arthur got home, everything was not only finished, but she'd set aside a few of the sweets for her husband and his enormous sweet tooth. Something smells good, he said as he walked into the kitchen, leaning down to kiss her. What are you feeding me? I made you a shepherd's pie. There's fresh bread to go with it, and I made you cookies for dessert. She decided to make a third, wanting to be sure it was good before anyone ate it. Can we start with dessert? he asked, winking at her. He rubbed his hands together in anticipation. No. Because if you did, you'd miss out on my shepherd's pie. And trust me, you don't want to miss it. Is it that good? he asked, his eyes lighting up. I used to make it for boxed socials, and men would bid on my meal forever, each hoping to be the one to get to eat it. Are you sure they weren't bidding on the chance to have lunch with you? he asked. If it had been him, he would have cared a great deal more about the chef than the meal she'd made. She nodded emphatically. Do you know how I know? He shook his head. How? One of them told me. He said, none of us really care to eat with you, because you're so smart, but you're the best cook in all of Missouri, and we want your shepherd's pie. I think my parents despaired of me ever marrying. They thought I'd live with them forever. Did you live with them while you taught school? The first semester I did, but my second semester, I boarded with a family in the school district. I preferred staying at home, but part of my salary was my room and board, and my father thought it would be good for me to get away from them for a little while. Her father had been right. He frowned at her. Even though you didn't want to. She shrugged. Sometimes parents make their children do things they don't want to do for their own good. It was a very good experience for me. I met new people and I had to stand on my own two feet a bit more than usual. I liked it when I was finished. I could have done it much easier the next time. Do you ever wish you were still in Missouri teaching? He asked. Beatrice thought about it for a moment. In some ways. I miss my parents, especially my mom. If we had stayed in Missouri where we belonged, I'd still have her. But being here is good for me, too. I mean, I have you. He smiled at that. At least you didn't say you would rather be in Missouri in every way. Well, I was honest, which is what I think you wanted from me. She took a bite of her dinner. 
The angel came back today. She did? What did she say? Arthur snapped to attention at her words. He was very curious about this person that kept visiting her. He almost wished he could see her, but he wasn't sure if that's what he truly wanted. Yes, she did. She wanted to tell me to listen to you. She wants me to stay inside whenever I can to stay safe. Beatrice hated admitting to him that Gabriella agreed with him and not with her, but she wouldn't lie to him. She does? Did she tell you she was your guardian angel? She shook her head. She told me she was an angel, and she told me to call her Gabriella. I asked if she was finished with me, and she said she'd come back if I needed her. Beatrice had no idea if she'd ever need her again, or if Gabriella would think she needed her. So you don't know if you'll see her again or not. He wasn't sure if he was pleased Gabriella would leave her alone, or if he wanted her to keep helping his wife. Either way, his opinion didn't seem to matter. No, I don't. She told me that she led me to you though, because you're the one who can make me happy. He grinned at that. I like that idea. I'll make you happy every day if only you'll let me, and if I stay in the house and don't get into trouble? She shook her head. I didn't say that. You did. She sighed. It was better today, because I was busy. I think baking for Mortimer is going to help me a lot. She hated that she needed to always be doing things. Maybe when the children started coming, she would be less needy in that way. I'm glad. How's your ankle? He'd been watching her move, and she didn't seem to be favoring it. It's fine. It hasn't bothered me all day. I'm sure it's ready for me to return to regular activities. She shrugged, not worrying about it at all any longer. I'm not sure baking as much as you did today can be considered regular activities. Well, I've always been one to be on my feet a lot. Whether teaching or helping my mother with cooking. I even did some of the milking to help my father out. I think he always wanted boys to help with the farm, but I was the only child they had. She frowned at him. Do you know I know nothing about you? Where are you from? I'm from New York. I lived upstate until I was 18, and then I spent a few months in the big city, before deciding I wanted to learn to run a telegraph station. Beatrice nodded. What about your family? He had never mentioned his family at all. Of course, she'd been monopolizing the conversations with her tales of her past. I was raised on a dairy farm. My parents had twelve kids, eight of which were boys. I was right in the middle, and I wasn't needed on the farm, so I moved on to make my own way in life. Do you ever miss your family? Arthur shrugged. Sometimes. I sure have missed my mother's cooking over the years, but I'm not missing them nearly as much now that you're here. I think your belly missed them. She grinned at him. Have you always been this hungry? She'd never met a man who was always hungry the way Arthur was, but truth be told, she hadn't spent a lot of time with men. I guess I have. My mother always said I had hollow legs. She complained that she could never fill me up from the time I was a baby. And I've always loved sweets. She'd bake a cake at night, and it would be gone when she woke up. It was always me. Oh, my, I need to keep my baked goods for the mercantile under lock and key. He laughed. I think I can keep myself out of the store's treats, as long as you make me my own. He was sure it was a good compromise. She shook her head, standing up to get him a plate full of cookies and a glass of milk to drink. Happy now? No. You're not? She frowned at him, wondering what the problem was. He caught her hand and pulled her down on his lap, kissing her softly. There. Now I'm happy. I need the cookies, but I also need my sweet bride. I'm surprised you can still call me sweet with as angry as I was with you last night. She was embarrassed by how upset she'd gotten, when she'd known all along that he was making the rules for her own good. I understand what happened there. You were lonely and tired of being cooped up in the house. It's beautiful outside, and you want to feel free to wander around and do what you want to do. You want the freedom you thought you'd have in Creed. I'm sorry you can't have it, at least not yet. 
I promise as soon as the women are found and whoever's responsible is behind bars, I will allow you to do as you please. I'd like that. She kissed his cheek and got off his lap to go start washing the dishes while he ate his cookies. Aren't you having any cookies? Arthur asked. Usually she shared his sweets with him. She shook her head. I nibbled all day as I baked. We don't want me to get bigger than a house, either. He shrugged. I don't think I'd mind at all. You're beautiful how you are, but you'd be beautiful with a little extra weight as well. You're so sweet to me, what have I done in my life to deserve you? She kept washing the dishes as they walked, hoping that she would be finished in time to go and listen to him read. Are you going to read to me this evening? I want to work on the pillows for the parlor. I would love to. I think I look forward to our reading time more than anything else all day. I was sad to miss it last night. She frowned. Let's never go to bed angry again. I feel horrible about the way I treated you. I could have come to you and tried to talk it out, but I was angry as well. You're right though, we shouldn't go to bed angry with each other. Arthur popped his last cookie into his mouth. I'll go in and find my page. Are you almost finished? She nodded. I have another few things to dry, and then I'll be in. Millie came to visit Beatrice on Saturday. There are rumors that you're making baked goods for all of Creed. Beatrice laughed. I'm making baked goods for the mercantile, so anyone can buy them. I guess that means that I'm making them for all of Creed. She wasn't about to argue with all of the rumors about her. Are you making them now? Yes, I am. I'm making cookies. I got word that Mortimer ran out within ten minutes of opening this morning, because there was a line. I promised I'd have more to him by lunchtime. Beatrice couldn't believe how excited all the men were for her baked goods. It's only nine. Surely between the two of us we can make that happen. Beatrice paused in measuring flour to hug her friends. I'm so glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. It's good to have someone to talk to. Arthur and I had a big fight over me having to stay in all day. I want to be able to leave and not be caged. I love to feel the sunshine on my arms, but I'm not allowed to go outside at all unless he's with me. Or your brother. That's just sad. I wish it was safer here in Creed, but I do understand the worry. Millie slipped an apron on and picked up a spoon, starting to drop cookies onto the cookie sheet. If I had more spare time, I'd be here with you every day. I hate that you're driving over that trail every time you come to see me. It's scary, it is. Millie got quiet for a moment. I sure wish you could come to church. I wish I could too, but it's just not possible. I do hope Callum understands. Beatrice was worried he would regret marrying them because she didn't go to church every Sunday. Oh, how she prayed there would soon be a pastor there in their town. Of course he understands. He was one of the first people to see you after the death of your parents, and he knows how upset you were. No one expects you to be able to just go down that trail again so soon. I'm glad. Beatrice hated the idea of upsetting Callum, because he'd been very good to her, but she just couldn't go to his church. Not yet, anyway. Working together, they had the cookies ready thirty minutes before Mortimer planned to pick them up. They carefully packed them into a box, and Beatrice opened the door to the telegraph office with the box of cookies. Behind her was Millie carrying a plate of cookies, just for Arthur. Arthur was quickly making notes as a message came in, so they just set the cookies beside him and disappeared back into the house. When they were back, Millie smiled. So, what can I help you do now? You don't have to come and help me. We can just sit and chat as friends. Idle hands and all that. I don't like to sit around doing nothing. What are we sewing these days? Beatrice laughed, pulling out the curtains she was making for the parlor. First curtains, and then I'll start working on some knitting projects. Would you believe no one ever taught me to knit? I would love to learn. Well, the next time you come, we'll work on knitting. Do you crochet? Beatrice loved the idea of helping her friend learn to do something new. Yes, I've been crocheting for years, but knitting is so much more complicated. 
Beatrice shrugged. I'll have you knitting in no time. A few minutes later, Arthur stepped through the door. Thank you for the surprise ladies. It was nice to find a plate of cookies beside me when I finished my task. Did Mortimer come and pick up the other cookies? Beatrice asked, getting to her feet to make him a plate. She'd reheated leftovers from the night before, he never complained about anything she cooked, because she hadn't yet made him any beans. Yes, he came right before I left for lunch. He said to tell you thank you, and he'd like triple the normal cookie order for Monday. He said the pies don't sell nearly as well as the cookies, so less pies and more cookies, but keep the same number of loaves of bread. Arthur sighed. There, I think that's the whole message. Maybe he should have tapped it out in Morse code to help you remember it, Beatrice said cheekily. He shook his head at her, washing his hands, and taking his place at the table. Are you eating with us, Millie? Well, if I'm invited I am. I sure do have fun when I get to spend my days with your wife. She keeps me busy, and that's what I like. Millie set the pillow she was stitching down and accepted the plate Beatrice filled for her. Of course, you're invited, Beatrice said. You spent half of your morning helping me bake cookies, and you'll spend your afternoon helping me sew. I couldn't begrudge you a meal. I'm getting good at sewing for my supper, Millie said with a giggle. Arthur was happy to see the two women enjoying themselves so much. Well, I'm just glad you're getting to spend the day together, no matter what you're doing. He knew it would make his life easier, because it would make Beatrice so much happier having her friend there. Then he wouldn't have to worry about her being upset about staying inside for another day or two. Me too, Beatrice said happily. My days are always best when I spend them with Millie. After Arthur was gone, they quickly washed up the few dishes and settled down to chat while they sewed. This time they settled in the parlor, where the furniture was more comfortable. I think these pillows are going to make your room beautiful, Millie said. I'm glad you chose this color, as it's just perfect for what you're doing. I agree, Beatrice said, looking around her. Between the pillows and the curtains, I'll be done in here. I already have the kitchen ready to go. Now I just need to make a quilt for the bedroom. She wanted to have the quilt done before Arthur started joining her in the big bed. You're doing a great job of making it all perfect. I can't wait until you have a little one on the way. It will be fun to sew those tiny little clothes together. I love the idea of having a house full of little ones, Beatrice said. I want all of them to look just like Arthur. Now to my way of thinking, a baby will look awfully funny with a beard. Millie grinned. Beatrice laughed softly. Yes, probably. Hopefully they'll look just like Arthur without the beard. You're falling in love with him, aren't you? Beatrice hadn't even thought it was possible to fall in love in less than two weeks, but she nodded. He's very kind to me, and he's always looking out for my interests first. He doesn't mind that I'm making money with my baking, and he reads to me at night. I can't imagine a man who would be better for me. She realized it was just as Gabriella had said. Arthur was definitely the man for her. I'm so glad it's working out for you. Callum came home after marrying you and told me he hoped he'd not done you a disservice. He knew it would be hard to marry a stranger and immediately move in with him, but he also knew what a good man Arthur was. He hoped it would all work out for the best. We pray for the two of you every day. Thank you. Beatrice was touched by her friend's words. We're going to be just fine together. I don't think he loves me, but at least he cares for me. I can tell with everything he does. He's good to me. Are you going to be handing out sweets on Monday morning again? Because I talked to Callum, and he said that I could join you if I wanted to. Beatrice shook her head sadly. After the shooting last week, he thinks that I need to stay inside instead of passing out sweet. I wish I could still do it, but I know that Arthur only has my best interests in mind. Instead, we'll go on a picnic tomorrow afternoon, and I'll do a lot of baking in the morning to prepare sweets for the store on Monday. When you were on your way here, I bet you never thought you'd be starting a business with your baking, did you? No, I didn't. Really, I hope to be able to teach here like I did back home, but there don't seem to be enough children. Beatrice longed to teach again, but apparently it would have to wait until she had her own children. 
Oh, there are enough children. It's just that most of them come from poor families who don't value education as they should. Millie shook her head. I don't think they realize that by not being educated, they're ensuring that their children will always be poor as well. I don't know how to get that through to people. I'm not sure there's a way. I know it was the same back in Missouri. People wouldn't send their children to school, claiming they had done fine for themselves without being able to read or write. While that may be true, I think it never hurts to better oneself. Beatrice wished she had an answer, but she didn't. Maybe there wasn't one. I think educating the people of Creed would be a good first step to stop the corruption here, but I don't know if there's a way to do that. The men care only for their liquor and gambling. The few women are at the mercy of their husbands. Millie shook her head. I'd fix all of them if I could. After Millie left for the day, Beatrice was still thinking about ways to make Creed a better place to live. She made a huge pot of chicken and dumplings for supper, hoping that she could use some of it for supper the next night as well, as they would be out a good portion of the day for their picnic. When Arthur came home, she asked him, Do you think education would solve the problems in Creed? He shrugged. It would solve some of them, because people wouldn't be required to work in the mines if they could do other things. The one problem it wouldn't solve is that people don't think they need to learn. They're content as they are. But why are they content? Shouldn't they want better things for their families? For their children? Beatrice wanted the very best for her future children, and she couldn't imagine anyone else being different. Most of the people here have no families or children. There's a reason our neighboring town is called Bachelor, and that's because there are so few families around. Arthur sighed. I don't have an answer for what will fix things, but I know that another woman has disappeared. That's the first thing we need to fix around here. Not education. You're right. I'm sorry, I keep thinking of ways I can help the community, and as a trained teacher, I think that should be a way. She shook her head. That's probably not the answer right now. Maybe later, but for now, we just need to figure out why the women are disappearing and why everything in town seems to be so corrupt. He sat down at the table and looked down at the bowl of chicken and dumplings she'd placed before him. This was my favorite meal as a boy. It's always been one of my favorites too. I made enough that we can have it for supper tomorrow too. Good, we'll be out most of the day at our picnic, anyway. And I have to do my baking in the morning, she reminded him. And laundry. It can hang on the line while we're out. You know we don't need the money you're making, right? He didn't want her to think that she needed to earn money to help them get by, because it just wasn't true. I know. But I need the work to keep my sanity. Beatrice frowned, thinking about how hard it was to stay inside. She no longer blamed him for it, but she still hated it. It'll get better, Arthur told her. I promise. Chapter 9 A week later, Millie came to visit Beatrice on Friday afternoon. Beatrice had been cooped up inside, wanting to be out and enjoying the fair weather. Every day when Arthur went to work, all she could think about was how he had a view of the street and she didn't. She didn't exactly resent him for it, but she was tired of being stuck indoors. When she saw it was Millie at the door, Beatrice grabbed her friend in a huge hug. I was needing a visit with you. Millie smiled. I was needing to see you too. I begged Callum to bring me so we could have a few hours together. Are we baking today? You don't have to help me work. I hate that every time you come here, you end up doing some of my chores. Beatrice led Millie into the kitchen. This time, you're going to sit, and I'm going to make tea for you and feed you cookies. You can't feed me the cookies that you made for the mercantile. Oh, don't worry about that. I make cookies for the store and some for home every single day. Arthur has a sweet tooth like I have never seen before. He wants sweets with every meal, between meals, and late at night, I have to keep him supplied. Beatrice shook her head with a laugh. I don't know what he'd do without treats. Millie laughed. Sounds like you have your husband figured out. For the most part, I really think I do. Beatrice put together a plate full of cookies while the water heated for tea. How are things in Bachelor? 
Good. I saw you didn't make it to church last weekend. I wish I knew how to get you past your fears. I do too. I have no answers, though. My anxieties about that trail overwhelm me. Beatrice hated that she let her fears keep her from doing the things she wanted to do, but she didn't know how to get past them. I've been praying for you to be less afraid. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Beatrice set the cookies on the table and poured hot water into the teapot, setting two cups on the table as well. She sat down across from her friend. If I could just spend a little time outside, I don't think I'd be going quite so crazy. When I taught back in Missouri, I often took the children outside to do their studies, not to help them, but because I hated to be cooped up inside. I know you do. I'm not fond of it either, but thankfully, Callum isn't quite as strict about the places I go and the things I do as Arthur is. Callum isn't worried you'll disappear like the other ladies? She found it hard to believe. I'm sure the thought has crossed his mind, but he's not one to dwell on that type of thing. Beatrice knew the only reason Arthur worried was because he cared about her. It didn't really make things all that much easier, though. Someday you'll marry. I wonder how your husband will be with things like that. I have no idea. I hope he'll be understanding. Millie shrugged. I really haven't thought a lot about getting married. I enjoy keeping house for Callum and ministering as much as I can to others. After their tea, Beatrice went back to baking while Millie stood beside her and talked to her. They chatted about everything under the sun, just happy to be together enjoying their day. Once the baked goods were finished, they moved into the parlor and Millie and Beatrice each worked on sewing pillows for the parlor. I meant to have these finished by now, but the baking I'm doing is keeping me busy. Millie smiled. You have time to get this house just the way you want it. And I'm sure it'll soon be safe for you to go outside whenever you want as well. I hope so. There was a knock on the door, and Beatrice rushed to see who it could be. Even with Millie there, she was only allowed to open to Callum, so she hoped it wasn't someone else. When she looked, there was no one there, but she saw a basket on the front step. She looked at it curiously, wondering who could have left it. She looked over at Millie. There's a basket on the step. I don't know who put it there, because no one waited at the door. Millie frowned, getting to her feet. Are you going to see what it is? Do you think I should? I don't want to disobey Arthur by opening the door, but I want to see what it is. Beatrice was torn, not knowing what to do, but she had a very strong feeling she needed to look. Would he be upset with you if you looked? Beatrice shrugged. I'm really not sure. She bit her lip. I feel like I should look. Millie sighed. I don't know what to tell you. I'm right here if you decide to look. If something happens to me, you'll run and get Arthur? Beatrice knew she was going to do it, but she needed to make sure she had someone to make sure she was safe. Of course I will, but nothing will happen. Beatrice unlocked the door and opened it just wide enough to pull the basket inside with Millie standing just behind her. When she got the object inside, she locked the door quickly. Well, we're still alive even though we opened the door during the day, she told Millie with a laugh. Millie shook her head, I never thought you'd die from opening a door. That's because you haven't spent enough time talking to Arthur. He's certain opening doors will be the death of me. Beatrice looked down at the basket, which was filled with blankets. Who would have left this on my doorstep? What is it? Millie asked. Beatrice leaned down and picked up the top blanket, stopping to stare at the object in shock. It's a baby. She leaned down and picked the baby up, cradling it against her. Who would have left a baby on her doorstep? Millie frowned. Why is there a baby on your doorstep? I have no idea. Beatrice felt slightly panicked at the idea of someone wanting her to raise their baby. Millie looked down at the basket again, trying to figure out where the baby could have come from. She lifted something from the blankets and held it up for Beatrice to see. This was in with it. Holding out her hand for the object Millie held, Beatrice froze. It's my grandmother's locket. She turned it over in her hand, seeing that her grandmother's initials were on the back. This went into the ravine with my parents. 
But, how? Millie looked into the blankets again. She moved them around, looking for something else that would tell them where the baby had come from. She found diapers instead. There are more than a dozen diapers here. I don't know how it got there. I have no idea where the baby or the locket came from, but I'm sure glad she came with diapers. Beatrice frowned at Millie. I have to go tell Arthur. He needs to know what's happening. She dreaded the very idea of telling her husband she'd opened the door. Telling him she was keeping a baby would be nothing in comparison. Millie nodded. I'll go with you. Beatrice shook her head. No, I think he's going to be angry with me, and I need to face him alone. I'll be back in a moment. Arthur needed to feel like he could yell at her freely. Aren't you going to see if the baby is a boy or a girl first? Beatrice looked at the child. It's only wearing a diaper. I guess I should look. Good idea, Millie said, watching as Beatrice laid the baby on its back and checked. It's a girl. Beatrice refastened the diaper and picked the baby up. Now I need to go show Arthur. I'll be right back. I'll pray. Millie told Beatrice as she rushed through the house. Once she reached the door to Arthur's office, she took a deep breath and opened it. Arthur was with a customer, so she waited. The man who was talking to Arthur nodded toward her. I heard you married. She's a pretty thing. Arthur spun around and looked at Beatrice standing there, holding a child. Beatrice, this is Hugh Fontaine. He owns a saloon in Bachelor, and he sends his orders through me when he's in town. Hugh, this is my wife, Beatrice. Why was she holding a child? It was odd enough that she was disturbing him at work, because she'd only opened the door to his office once or twice in their three weeks of marriage. Beatrice nodded at the man. It's nice to meet you, Mr. Fontaine. Mr. Fontaine tipped his hat to her. Ma'am. Then he nodded to Arthur. That's it for today. I'm going to go see if I can sit in on a game at the Nugget Saloon. I feel like Lady Luck is with me today. With that he was off. Arthur looked at Beatrice for a long time, sitting silently. Where did that baby come from? He'd seen Beatrice just hours before, and she hadn't had it then. Beatrice shrugged. There was a knock on the door, so I looked out the window, and there was a basket on the doorstep. Millie was with me, so I opened the door just a bit, and I pulled the basket in and found this baby inside. She held up her locket. I also found this, which was in the basket with the baby. My grandmother gave it to me when I left Missouri, and I was sure I'd never see it again after it went into the ravine with my parents. He frowned at her. You opened the door? How did I know that would be the part of the story you focused on? Yes, I opened the door, but just a little, and Millie was with me. There was a baby. Only he would ignore the whole story except the fact that she opened the door. Whose baby is it? he asked. You know as much as I do. How do we go about finding her parents? It's a girl? He frowned at the baby in her arms, wondering what to do next. I'll wire the nearby towns and see if there are any missing babies. But even if we find her parents, how do you explain the locket? How would that have ended up in this baby's basket on our doorstep? She shook her head, wondering how the baby had ended up with her locket. A baby on her doorstep wasn't all that unbelievable with the world the way it was, but that baby having her locket in her basket? That really confused her. I'll start wiring the town's closest. We'll find her parents. Beatrice looked down at the baby in her arms, and a sense of longing filled her. She didn't want to ever let her go. All right. She turned around to go back into the house, stopping for a moment. I'm sorry I opened the door. I shouldn't have, knowing it would upset you. Arthur said, we'll talk about it later. I need to figure out where the baby came from now. Beatrice nodded, going inside. She understood that he was angry with her, and she could deal with that. The baby had to be her first obligation. When she got back inside, Millie was sitting in the parlor, still sewing. I finished my pillow, so I started to work on yours. All right. Beatrice sat down, looking into the face of the sleeping baby. Her cheeks were pink, and she looked to be the picture of health. 
so what would possess a parent to give up a baby like this? She couldn't believe the child had been stolen. There was another knock on the door, and this time, Millie went to check to see who was there. It's Callum, Millie sighed. I'll have him ask around to see if anyone knows where she came from. Beatrice nodded. Thank you for coming to see me today. Of course. I'll be back soon. Millie left, leaving Beatrice sitting in her parlor, staring down at the child in her arms. Where did you come from? Someone has to be looking for you. No one is looking for her. She was cast out, left outside to fend for herself, so I brought her to you. Gabriella sat across from Beatrice, as calm as if she'd been there every day. Did you like that I found your locket? I thought that might be important to you. You brought me a baby. Why? Gabriella shrugged. I have more than one charge at a time, you know. This little girl was mine, and if I'd left her there, death would have come for her, too. Death has taken his share of people from this town lately, so I decided that he couldn't have her, but, what should I do with her? Beatrice loved children, but she wasn't sure she was ready to be a parent today. Maybe after nine months of carrying one inside her, she'd get used to the idea of being a mother. The same thing you'd do with a child of your own. Love her. The child stirred in her arms then, struggling to sit up. Until that moment, Beatrice hadn't realized quite how old the baby was, but she was able to sit up on her own, so she must be at least nine months or so. Arthur is trying to find her parents. He won't find them. They were lost, the same as yours were. Now it's time for you to decide if you want each other. Gabriella watched Beatrice carefully. You do want her, don't you? I do, but I'm not sure how Arthur feels. You're not sure how I feel about what? Arthur asked from the doorway to the kitchen. He glanced over at the chair Gabriella was sitting in, jumping. Who are you? I know your wife has told you about me. I'm Gabriella. I brought you the baby. Arthur frowned. I have sent telegrams to every city near us, and they will spread the message further. So far, no one knows who the baby is, and no one will. Gabriella looked at Arthur. The baby belongs to you. Or it can. It's up to you if you'll keep her. Her parents are gone now. But, what will we do with her? Gabriella shook her head. The same thing you would do with a baby of your own, of course. Love her. Arthur looked at Beatrice. Do you want to keep her? Now that the baby was awake, she was sitting still, looking around her at the people in the room. She looked so serious, her eyes made Beatrice want to weep. I do. I can't imagine giving her up. He frowned. But you've only had her for a short while, I know that. But I don't want to let her go. She couldn't explain her need to keep this baby. She wished she could. Gabriella looked at Arthur. How did you feel when you first met Beatrice? How long did it take you to realize that you didn't want to let her go? Arthur shrugged. Not long, but still. Sometimes one soul calls out to another. They realize they belong together. That's how it is with Beatrice and Sally. Beatrice looked up at that. Sally? Is her name Sally? Gabriella nodded, getting to her feet. I'll leave her with you tonight. When I come back Sunday, you'll need to let me know if you will keep her or not. What happens if we won't? Beatrice asked. I'll find someone else for her. It won't be someone she belongs with, like you, but someone will take her in. Gabriella walked toward the door. You're going to use a door? Beatrice asked, a bit shocked. You never use doors. Gabriella grinned a grin that was anything but angelic. I don't want to give Arthur a heart attack quite yet. Thank you for that, Arthur said, watching the woman open the door and leave. What are we going to do? Beatrice shrugged. That's a decision we need to make together, but I want to keep her. I think we need to really talk, then. So do I. Chapter 10 Beatrice walked into the kitchen with Arthur, still snuggling the baby close. She handed the baby to Arthur while she pulled the pot roast, carrots, and potatoes out of the oven. 
will you hold her while I make the gravy? Arthur nodded, looking down at the beautiful little girl in his arms. Her hair was so light it was white, and she had big blue eyes. She's pretty. She is. Beatrice hoped that by holding the baby, Arthur would bond with her the same as she had, but she didn't tell him that. Instead, she carefully separated a tiny bit of each food she'd prepared and put it onto a plate to cool for the baby, then she started to make the gravy. Arthur frowned at the baby. So your name is Sally, is it? The baby patted his cheek in response. She didn't seem to be talking yet. Where did you come from? The baby sat quietly, looking at him as if she was one hundred years old, instead of just a few months. She seemed to know that he wouldn't hurt her for anything. Why did you open the door? Arthur asked. It was the burning question inside him. He needed to know why Beatrice had done something that would upset him so much. She knew how he felt about her safety. Beatrice looked down at the gravy she was making, frowning. I'm not sure really. I went to the door to see if it was Callum, but it wasn't. No one was there. No one I could see anyway. I opened the door, and pulled the basket in quick. Millie promised me that if something happened, she would come tell you right away. She knew he wouldn't like that she had Millie as her protection, but it was the truth, and she wasn't about to lie to him. Well, I guess that's something. I'm glad she was watching your back, even though she couldn't have done anything but run for me. Arthur couldn't believe how betrayed he felt by her opening that door. Yes, she'd been fine, and yes, there had been a baby out there, and the door had needed to be opened, but she hadn't known all that, and he'd been due home less than an hour later. She couldn't have waited that long? I'm sorry, Arthur. I know it's not something you would have wanted me to do. I felt compelled to do it. Like I felt compelled to get out of the wagon when Gabriella appeared to me in the back of it. I didn't know what else to do. Arthur frowned, looking at the little girl with the ancient eyes. Her eyes were truly a bit unsettling. I guess I understand that. I hope you'll be more careful in the future. I don't know how I'd feel if I came home to find you gone. I will do my best. Beatrice carefully fixed plates for both of them, ladling gravy over their meals, but not over Sally's. I hope she knows how to eat. She sat down and pulled the baby into her arms, holding a small piece of potato up to her mouth. The baby chewed it hungrily, opening her mouth for more. She does know how to eat. She probably still needs milk, but if we could get her a baby bottle, she could drink cow's or goat's milk. Arthur watched Beatrice with the baby. You're going to be heartbroken if we don't keep her, aren't you? Beatrice bit her lip, nodding. I am. I know it doesn't make sense, but my heart already belongs to this little girl. Gabriella said she belongs with us. Well, that wasn't exactly what she said, but that was the meaning of it. Let's see if I get any responses tomorrow, and if I don't, we'll keep her. He couldn't believe he was agreeing to it, but they both had said they wanted a big family. We'll have to add on to the house to make it big enough for her. Where will she sleep? Beatrice shrugged. We could get her a bed and put it in the corner of our room. It was the first time she'd referred to the room she was using as their room and not her own. Our room, he asked, raising an eyebrow at her. Was she trying to tell him something? She nodded. I do think it's our room. There's no reason for us to keep waiting. She knew she loved him, and whether he loved her or not, she was willing to let their marriage be a real one. How could she not be? He looked at her, his eyes searching hers. Are you sure? I'm sure. I love you. Why would I keep making you wait? She hadn't meant to blurt the words out like that, but he deserved to hear them. Since she'd come into his life, it seemed that everything he'd done had been for her. He had a right to know she loved him. You love me? Really? Really. I never would have let you force me to stay inside otherwise. He grinned, wishing he could take her hand, but she had both hands full with the baby in her arms. I'm glad you stayed inside. I feel like you're safe when I know you'll do that. Will it be easier to stay inside with a baby in your arms? He hoped this was what she needed to be more settled. Yes. I won't be tempted to go out knowing she could be in danger. 
I could never endanger our Sally. Beatrice looked down at the baby, who looked up at her when she heard her name. Do you think we can get a baby bottle tonight? I'm sure we can, I will go over to Mortimer's after supper. He was actually excited to do it. He wanted to get everything they needed for the baby. Already he felt like she belonged to them. As soon as he finished eating, he hurried off to his friend's house to get him to open the store. Mortimer came to the door, looking tired. What do you need me to open up for tonight? Someone left a baby on our doorstep. Arthur wisely decided not to talk about his wife's guardian angel. Who would believe him? He wasn't sure he completely believed until he saw her sitting in a chair in his parlor. We need a baby bottle for her. Maybe a few. I'd get at least three, Mortimer said, shutting his door and hurrying around the building to the store. It's faster than going through the house. Arthur didn't question him, simply following the other man inside. Can I get this on credit and pay you tomorrow? I can just take it out of the money I owe Beatrice for the baked goods if that's easier. Oh, I forgot you owed her money. That sounds good. I can't believe I left the house to buy something with no money in my pocket. Of course, I wasn't expecting to come home from work to a baby. Did you try to find her mother? Mortimer asked. He'd heard stories of babies being left on doorsteps, of course, but he'd always wondered where they came from. I sent out several telegrams to neighboring towns. If no one knows where she came from, we'll keep her. Beatrice is already in love with the little girl. And with me. He wanted to shout it from the rooftops, but he knew better. It wasn't something a man was supposed to do, no matter how happy he was about having the love of his new wife. Mortimer made a note on a ledger and gave him three baby bottles to take home with him. What's this going to do for my baked goods? Am I still going to get a regular supply? Arthur shrugged. Knowing Beatrice, you'll have the same amount as always. She needs to keep busy, and I think this baby will help with that, not keep her from doing other things. Good. I don't know if I could stop the riots if I didn't carry her cookies every day. The men love all of her baked goods, but they love her cookies the most. I run out by early afternoon every day, and the men who come after that look so disappointed. She sure got away in the kitchen. Arthur couldn't believe how blessed he'd been to find a wife like Beatrice. I'm glad she's helping your business go so strong. She's the best thing I've done for business in months. Mortimer grinned. I'm glad you found her. Me too. The whole way home, Arthur thought about what a wonderful blessing his sweet bride was. And now it looked like they'd been blessed with a baby as well. When he walked in the door, he found Beatrice pacing back and forth with the baby patting her back. She's hungry. Arthur held up one of the bottles he carried. Should I just put milk into it? I don't know what else to do at the moment. Just fill it with the milk we have, and if it seems to upset her stomach, we'll switch to goat's milk as soon as we can. She continued patting Sally's back and bouncing her slightly as he hurried to the kitchen to get the milk. Here it is, Arthur told her. It had only taken him a moment to fill the bottle and she sat down, cradling the baby to her. It only took a moment for the baby to start sucking at the bottle. Beatrice looked at Arthur and smiled. Hopefully she can tolerate it. She'd heard of babies who could only drink goat's milk, so hopefully Sally would be fine on the cow's milk. He sat down to watch her feed the baby, not even thinking to grab his book. He loved the way she looked holding Sally, and he knew she would be a good mother. The baby was asleep in minutes, though she continued to suck. When the bottle was drained, Beatrice pulled the nipple from her mouth, and she handed the bottle to Arthur, who carried it into the kitchen. Beatrice put the baby to her shoulder and patted her back. As soon as Sally let out a loud burp that was incongruous with how sweet the baby looked, Beatrice carried her into the bedroom. She frowned as she looked at the right place for the baby, and finally decided to let her sleep in the basket Gabriella had brought her in. Once the baby was settled, she went to the kitchen to do the dishes and clean up. She was amazed at how tired just those few hours with the baby had made her, but she felt more fulfilled than she had since her arrival. She loved to feed her husband and keep him happy, but she also loved the idea of raising the tiny little girl lying in a basket at the foot of her bed. 
When the dishes were finished, she joined Arthur in the parlor, not taking any sewing with her. She curled up against his side, her head on his shoulder. She was content in a way she hadn't thought she could be again. Arthur kissed the top of her head, smiling down at her. She's asleep? he asked. Yes, and the dishes are done. I'm surprised at how tired pacing with her made me. She's heavier than she looks. Are you sure you want the burden of raising someone else's child? Burden? Don't you mean blessing? And we're getting her young. She'll never remember having parents other than us. We can tell her someday, but for now, she'll only know us as her mother and father. Yes, I see her as a blessing, too. I just had to think on it a little longer than you did to come to that conclusion. Now that he'd come to it though, there was no taking that sweet little girl away from him. Beatrice grinned, looking up at him. I'm so happy you want to keep her. Just like I wanted to keep you from the moment I laid eyes on you. I hope you know how very much I love you, Beatrice. She blinked a few times. You do? You don't have to say that just because I did. I think I knew I loved you within three minutes of setting eyes on you. For me, when Reverend Bing suggested we marry, it was an opportunity that I couldn't let pass. I knew it was what I wanted right away. I was so relieved when you finally agreed. She grinned at him. It took me a few hours. Probably within a few minutes of setting eyes on your bookshelf, I knew that we were meant to be together. You complete me, Arthur. He leaned down and kissed her, his hand smoothing back her hair. I don't care if it took you hours or days. As long as you love me now, that's all I ask for. Standing on the street just outside their parlor window was Gabriella. She smiled to herself. That's three of my charges all taken care of. They just needed to find each other. She turned and strolled away, knowing that they would be happy, and she needed to go to work on some of her other jobs. She knew that Beatrice, Arthur, and little Sally would always have a special place in her heart though. What other situations did a guardian angel have where she could make sure that three people are happy all at once? Now she needed to concentrate on the next man on her list. He was going to take a lot more work than the last three, but after forming that little family, she felt she was up to the challenge. Not only up to it, but she was looking forward to it. She had finally found her stride. Her wings were polished and ready to go. She walked through the stable and out onto the road leading out of town. It was time to move on.